so first of all, I want to say thanks for coming on here. I know um, uh, we, you and I haven't talked in a long time, but we, you and I started our whole careers together. I mean, like we were at the very beginning and uh, I, I was just a, a young kid. I don't know how old you were. I think you were probably around the same age, but uh, I didn't know what I was doing. So when, when I hooked up with you, when you, when you and I were doing kind of the same things, it, you were, I know we were kind of peers at that time, but you were almost a mentor to me because wow. I would just, I, you, you pushed me so hard and you were like, Hey, we should probably do this. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. And I would just, I, if I wouldn't be anywhere, I would, I am right now if it wasn't for you, for sure. Because I was just trying to play catch up with you, man. So I, I appreciate, you know, you putting up with me and, uh, and being there and, uh, yeah, just pushing me hard, man. I mean, you got, <laughs> you really, you really helped me out. So I appreciate it. I it, honestly, it was, it's funny because it's a complete mirror. That's exactly how I felt about you. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, Isn't that funny? 100%. And I was like, I got to keep up with this guy. And it seemed like uh, the, the the first appeal, Jared, was your sense of humor. Dude, you were so funny, made me laugh <laughs> so hard all the time. And, and just the way that you, uh, the lens, like that you look at the world was something that I think made us instant friends. Yeah. And who was the other guy that was always with us through all the training? I don't know where he went. Day Savage. Like he went to De Savedra. Where did De Savedra end up? He ended up you, I lost track of him, but he ended up making chief. He did really well. He I think he's retired wow. now. I, I kind of lost touch with him, but I got I need we need to link it back up with him for sure. Yeah, the, so the three of us were like, you know, just like inseparable, yeah. <clears throat> pushing each other and uh because I think weren't the three of us were in the airborne program at tech school, right? I mean, that's that's the three that's who we that's who was doing it. And uh yeah, right. it was just like who could go the fastest and go the hardest and I like I swear like I said I, it's funny you say that about me because I was like I guys I'm like I got to catch up with son man I got to catch up with him I was just trying to like <laughs> <laughs> just trying to be there man Yeah was, um and it brings me into a story that I just remembered I haven't thought about in the longest time remember when we were going through and I can't remember which instructor it was but on one of the days he's like okay so they're going to pull you together for this group photo and make sure you have your beret with you and before they snap the shot, man, you, you know, you put on your black beret. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right, you know, no problem. That sounds cool. Didn't know anything about it, uh, about the ramifications of it. And so the day comes, I got separated from you guys. I was in a totally different company. So I think I was literally, I might have. Oh, you're talking about jump school. Company. Jump school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. jump school. Okay. So jump school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so airborne school, we were there and you, I think you guys were in the same company and I ended up being in the company by myself. Yeah. And so the big day comes where you're going to take the huge graduation picture. And so I had my beret with me. And I remember when we were marching over there, someone looked at me and they were like, what's in your pocket? I'm like, oh, dude, you know, I got this at graduation. I'm a tack P. And so we wear these black berets and he's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, didn't say anything else about it. So we get there, they position us all. I stick on my beret. They take the picture. I take it off and put it back in my pocket. I put on, you know, the patrol cap and go about my day. And I don't know if it was a week later, because I had completely forgot about it. And I got called into the Black Hat's office. And they <laughs> ripped me a new one, dude. They were so <laughs> mad. Air Force, you fucked up our picture. You're not supposed to look like everyone else. What are you doing? I was just like, uh, our instructors told us to do it. So I didn't know it was a big deal, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. yeah. Uh, I do remember that. That was hilarious. Did you do the same thing? I did because I, because I got the same gu guidance as you did. I, like it wasn't like, uh, hey, it'll be funny if you if you mess around with it. It was like, no, this is what you guys do is tack peas. You better get your berets on. And I was like, all right. I was the same deal. They called me in. They were, they chewed me out. They're like, you might not even graduate now. And I'm like, what? I, I just, I didn't, yeah. They told me to do it. Yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, I lost that picture too. I had a picture of of my class. And me with the only, but I can't remember. I can't find it anywhere. I, I lost it in all the PCSs and stuff. But yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, I, I lost <laughs> a lot of my memorabilia in my divorce with my, well, yeah. my first divorce, um, my only divorce. I lost a lot of my memorabilia. So like, I couldn't even remember this yesterday when I'm trying to fill out the paperwork. I'm like, what unit was I assigned to at Davis Moth? Oh, I, yeah. I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I have no idea. I forgot. So yeah, yeah I mean... I lived in uh, Redding, California, 
uh, and I went to school in Cottonwood, California. Okay. So when people are driving in California and they're getting close to Northern California, they're always on the I-5 freeway. And the last place you stop to get gas before you're going to head up into the mountains and probably make your way over to Oregon is Redding, California. Okay. And it's known for cattle and probably tourism. Uh, every time a big industry tries to come in there, it seems like they're board of supervisors for some reason votes it out. I know they've tried to do like universities there and all this kind of different stimulus. And for whatever reason, it's never worked out. So uh, I got done with high school and uh, my parents got divorced, uh, which was kind of, well, I, sh I shouldn't say my parents, like it was another stepfather. I had three stepfathers growing up. So my mother's latest marriage broke up and <clears throat> I was a good student. Uh, but I never applied for any kind of uh, scholarships or anything. I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, and I went to the community college for a couple of weeks and I was miserable. Yeah. And I remember just a couple of my buddies were like, oh, we're going to join the military. You should go check it out. And in Reading, they're all next to each other. Okay. So every single recruiter is lined up in the strip mall. And I believe the first one I went to was the Marines. And I walked, started walking the door. And there was a bunch of knuckleheads from my graduating class that were in there, like doing pull-ups and they, I don't know who the guys were there, but they were all excited. The, the recruiters and they were like, Ooh, yeah, Ooh, yeah, Ooh, yeah. And they're doing pull-ups. And I walked right out <laughs> I the next door to the next place. The next place I think was, was the army. And I sat down with the army recruiter and he was like, so what do you want to do? And I'm like, you know, I don't really know. Um, I don't know what I want to do. I just, I think, uh, I want to get out of this place. I want to learn some skills that I think will help me with the rest of my life. Uh, I've never really had uh, a father that I liked. So I feel like I need some discipline in my life and I feel like joining the military will, you know, give me a good, uh, internal compass. And so he sat me down and he's like, okay, you know, so we'll probably make you an 11 Bravo. Cause that's what everyone does. And he, he, he pulled out my ASVAB scores and he looked at him and he kind of went, whoa. And under his breath, I don't think he knew he said it. He goes, man, this guy should probably join the Air Force. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> in my brain, I'm like, huh? And so right there, it kind of <laughs> turned off the rest of what he said. Right, right. And so I think he said, yeah, you know, you, you know we, you'd probably be a good candidate for special forces, but there's a lot of schools you have to go through. So you have to just be a, a regular infantryman. And then at a certain point, you're going to volunteer for ranger school. And at a certain point, you're going to volunteer for this and volunteer for that. But at the end of the day, you're just an infantryman. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, I'm going to go check out, you know, the other options. And he's like, okay, okay. And so the next door was Navy. And so I cruise into Navy and I had all these, you know, pre, I don't even know what the right word is, but I had all these thoughts about what I thought the Navy was yeah. and the person sitting behind the desk who was a recruiter like all those conceptions or preconceptions or notions were gone. Cause this guy was like really overweight and I mean a bunch of chins and like none of his, <laughs> his uniform, didn't, his uniform didn't fit him in any way. <laughs> and I've always been a real like physical person. And I think those are the first traits that I'll use to judge a person is sure. on their physical appearance. And if they're in shape, or at least trying. And I looked at this guy and I was like, wow, is this what everyone in the Navy looks like? Like, forget it. And so he kind of went through the same spiel. And then he was like, yeah, you know, you probably should be a Navy SEAL because you know, everyone wants to be a Navy SEAL. Right, right. And he's like, well, you're going to be on a ship for six months at a time at least. And he's like, a lot of people, man. He was so honest with me that it was kind of cool. He's like, a lot of people just end up scraping paint. Oh. Until you get your job all you're responsible for is cleaning the ship. And I was like, whoa. This guy doesn't sound like a very good recruiter. <laughs> like he's out of shape, well, not a very good like, representation, telling you all this negative stuff. He's like, is he not, doesn't have a quota? I, dude, I, right? <laughs> when I know about recruiters now, I'm like, man, maybe that's why they put him in Reading. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the next person was the Air Force. And, you know, the Air Force guy did the typical thing. He's like, oh, you're involved in football and basketball and track and, He's like, oh, we have all those teams in the Air Force. So once you're done with, you know, basic training and you get your job and you report to your base, you know, you can start playing these sports and they have like professional teams that travel over the world. Like you can do this in the Air Force. 
And I was like, okay, cool. You know, and I, again, I went open general. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Oh I gosh. thought, well, you know, maybe I'll get like a job where I can learn a skill. Like, I, honestly, I was like optometrist or, you know, dental something. I was like, I can, I can learn some sort of skill that when I get out, I can turn that into a job in the civilian world. And that's kind of the notion I went on. And I know someone told me, go back to high school and get like letters of recommendation from your uh, principal and some of your teachers. So I know I did that kind of as my homework. And I remember like the day that you, I, Oakland is where like the in-processing center, center is. And my mom and her boyfriend drove me down there and I don't know, like I wasn't scared, but I was like, wow, big changes are coming. Yeah. And then, you know, you get on the plane and then you head to uh, Lackland, you know, San Antonio, and then you get off the bus and everything's still kind of chill and everyone's kind of, you know, telling stories. I think I ran into Murph, Murphy. Yeah, yeah. I ran into him, I ran into him in, San, in, in San Antonio in that big, like, mess of people. I just remember kind of running into him. Really? I believe, yeah, I believe we were in the same basic training class together. Wow. But for some reason, he was like in the next room over. So I didn't spend a lot of time with him until, you know, the day of basic training that they're like, all right, you know, this, this is the time you're going to go see your, your um, counselor and they are going to help you find your job. Yeah. And I went in there with the same story, Jared, like I was like, I you know, I want to be an optometrist or I want to be an x-ray tech or I want to get a job in the medical field. And I heard, you know, the Air Force has all these, you know, all these um, availability jobs, whatever out there. And the guy looked at my stuff and he's like, no, man. He's like, we got a job called um, TACP, Tach Layer Control Party. And he's like, you're going to go into the special operations job and you can go to airborne school. And he's like, that's the kind of job I see you doing. You're a fit person. You're smart looking at your ASVAB score. And he's like, this is the job I want you to do. And I was like, okay. I, mean, I had no idea. <laughs> Whatever you and, say. And, yeah. Right. And, and previously the day when like the, I think it's like the CCT or, and you know, combat control team guy or a pararescue guy comes in and does his spiel. Like I remember him coming in with the red maroon beret and the shiny boots and the bloused pants. And I had eaten some bad food in the chow hall. And I had to go to the bathroom so bad. And when he came in and he started his spiel, for some reason, he saw the look on my face and he was like, Airman, are you in trouble? And I was like, I have to go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> and I missed his whole presentation. Oh, man. And so then when the guys came back on the weekend from the pass test and they were like in their, you know, PT shorts and they were all wet. And I was like, where'd you guys go? And like, oh, we just went and took the pass test for pararescue and for CCT. I remember being so bummed because it was like an opportunity to go yeah. work out and go see, go do something fun. Anyways. So, you know, that led us to, uh, uh, what Pensacola or Fort Walton beach, Florida, um, heading out yeah. there uh, to start that training, which, uh, I just remember being in Florida and training in that heat and oh, it's brutal. You'd get ready. yeah, you'd get ready and you'd be all clean. And you wouldn't even get out of the shower and you were covered in sweat. And so it was just kind of like, You're right, point. right, right. And well, going back to that, I'm, I'm, we're kind of lucky. I was lucky that you didn't do the P because you would have smoked that PJ test, uh, the past test for sure. So it's kind of, I mean, I don't want to be selfish, but I'm kind of happy that you didn't make it at first because I know you ended up doing it later because I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have met you and I wouldn't have, you know, I think my life would have been a lot different if you hadn't done it. But uh, so I'm, I'm you know kind of selfish. I, and, I appreciate that. You know what I think too, though? I don't think I had the mental maturity at that point because oh, yeah. what I know now, which I believe that you and I and Disavedra, right? Disavedra? Yep. yep. Because we separated ourselves in TACP school, that is what started the building blocks. And then, like you and I talked about briefly yesterday via text, getting uh, Keith Ingram as our first you know, training mentor guy. Yeah. Um, I believe those were all the building blocks that then made it, made me successful when I went back to cross train into okay. Paris. Yeah. It makes sense. I believe, yeah. I think if I went straight out of, um, out of basic training, I'm not sure, man, knowing what I know now, Yeah, yeah. because every day of that training is a mental 
is mental. I mean, the, the physical is one thing, but it's, it's 100%. Are you mentally tough to just persevere one day at a time? And I believe right. because of like, we were at TACP school and, you know, every time one of the instructors went by, you had to just drop and do your push ups and <laughs> right, every right. Time, right. Every time we were out doing something, it was like, okay, cool. We want the guys who volunteered for everyone school, get up here and you guys are first to try everything, do everything. Another yeah. super funny story is what I tell people like, why'd you, you know, go into pararescue? And I said, well, I kind of got kicked in the balls by PJs three times. Oh. And one time was when you and I went out in the field for the first time in Florida, they made us dig fighting positions and we went out and did our night navs and they had PJs out there just in case any of us got hurt. Right. And I don't think I was with you at that point, like in your foxhole, no. but one of the PJs jumped over our fighting position in his quad runner. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, dude, I remember and it fucked up our fighting position and we had to, now maybe he didn't jump over it. I could be embellishing the story, but he definitely drove around or over our like mound of dirt that was left over. And it like totally just fucked up our fighting position. And we basically kind of had to <laughs> dig the whole thing from out again. He's laughing like, ha. Ah. <laughs> fucking with us and i remember my buddy being those fucking pjs man they're such assholes they think they're rah, 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 rah. that was like number one then right i got some girlfriend from going out in the clubs and stuff some really cute little blonde surfer girlfriend and we went out for a couple of weeks meaning like on the weekends i would see her down at the clubs and we would hang out and dance and she'd drive me around her car but she disappeared for right. a couple of weeks and then I saw her and she's like, oh, I met a PJ and he's my new boyfriend. And he had this big badass Jeep. And I was like, those fucking PJs, man. <laughs> and then fast forward to when you and I were in the, that big train exercise we did in Arkansas. Oh yeah. JRTC. JRTC. Yeah. When it was still and in Arkansas. Yeah. Now you know, we're dating ourselves. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're at JRTC. And again, you know, we're split up. Yeah. I'm with my, you know, my squad of guys. And we had some really cool Marine salt team guys that I hung with the whole time that really kept me kind of safe and sane because yeah, they, yeah. they just had the greatest sense of humor. And when the army would do their shit, they would totally do it. But the minute they'd turn their backs, like laughing and going, dude, Air Force, get over here. Let's do this. Let's do this shit over here. <laughs> right. They were so cool. Well, at a certain point in that exercise, from what I remember, everything kind of stopped and they had like a makeshift airfield out there and they started blowing up some pyrotechnics and these helicopters came in and they landed and, they, and then they went and they did something else. And they came back and these guys fast roped and they grabbed some people and they, oh, they're blowing all this shit up. And, you know, we weren't really involved in it, which I thought was kind of strange. And then they got right. the rental cars and drove away. <laughs> and the yeah. Marines were right. like, did you see that Air Force? I'm all, yeah. I'm like, Dude, those are PJs, bro. They just drove away in, the, in their rental cars. How come you're not going with them? Like, I thought you Air Force <laughs> guys stuck together. And I just was like, those fucking PJs, man. That's like the third <laughs> time. They're like kicking me in the balls every place, right? So <laughs> we got to the point uh, where uh, the Panamanian government or someone or the United States or someone was given back or there was some sort of troop reductions or something. Yeah. Down, uh, and, and so they were going to take the Moffat team or sorry, the, the Davis Monthan team. And we were going to get um, disbanded or something. I forget how it was going to go down, but it was like, we yeah. all got called into um, CVPO, which again is dating us. Cause they right. called like personnel flight or something. MPF. Yeah. <laughs> right. And they said, Hey, um, you have the opportunity to get out right now early, which I think it was maybe six months early, but it was like early. And then they said, or maybe it was a year. I think maybe I still had a year on my retire on my um, current enlistment. Or they said, you know, you have, and I remember like on the desk or on the like coffee table in this lady's office was Airman Magazine and it had a PJ on the front and they said, hey, you know, we're looking for cross trainees. And I remember just kind of looking at it and being like, huh, you know, whatever. And that was her spiel. She was like, you know, you have airborne school and you have survival school and you have water survival school. She's like, you have a lot of the same or some of the classes that you need or courses you need to become a PJ. Have you ever thought about cross training and pararescue? 
And I thought back to those three times that PJs had kind of kicked me in the balls. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go be a PJ. And I had no idea what that meant. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, I'll go try it. And remember who was the blonde guy who was a total stud who started training us like you and, um, the, oh, the I know Ron school. Bragoon. Was that who it was? Ron like, Bragoon. Was like yeah. The, he was like, okay. he was like so much older than us, but he would like smoke us all. He was like, he, I think he was like 30 something. And, uh, we go out on runs and we're just like barely keeping up with him. And yeah, he was, yeah, he was in great shape. Yeah. He's a good dude. And so, yeah, I remember he was getting you. I was an alternate and it was you and Pete. Right. What was Pete's last name? Pete Klein. Yeah. Klein. Yeah, dude, I loved him. <laughs> uh, so it, you and Pete Klein were getting ready for the, the Romad, um, like the yearly competition. Oh, right. Yep. And I remember, I think around those, that time I was talking about cross training. I remember you're saying his name was Ron Bergoon. I believe so. Yeah. I think that's his name. Ron was like, Sundance, you need to learn how to swim, dude, because they are going to crush you in the pool. Yeah. And I remember starting that with him, trying to learn how to swim. And then uh, our colonel, who was, uh, he was really cool. Our colonel, who um, was our, you know, our guy who was in charge of us for a while. Remember, he was like a pilot. And at one point, I can't remember his name. I was talking to somebody about that the other day, and we couldn't, I couldn't place it. I, I, it has escapes me for right now. Well, at one point, remember, he was like, I'll, I'll train you guys all how to fly. Just go through ground school. And I've got a plane and everything. Oh, that, yeah. He was so fucking cool. Yeah, but yeah. he's the one who did my pass test. And so I remember like he was just kicking me in the ball. You got to do more push-ups, dude. Like three more, three more. I was like, oh, fuck. Just pushing God. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and then it was a trip to leave all of you guys because I felt really comfortable with you guys. We had our yeah. own thing going. It was really cool. Uh, and going back to Lackland, dude. And going back to basic training and like it was it was worse as a as a cross trainee because you knew how comfortable the air force was right and now you're basically starting over again and, and they're treating you like you're a knucklehead again and you're like well, yeah. wait a minute dude like well, you know and i was one of the few guys there who like had a beret and was considered in special operations uh <laughs> so yeah just like starting over again and it was like mass attrition jared like i had no idea i remember walking to the dorm like this is where you're supposed to go and i'm like cool and i walked up and one of the guys who was the guard at that point uh his name was will wingert and he was in his 30s and he says to this day he's like dude you walked up and i was like who's this knucklehead <laughs> this big beefy dude he's never gonna make it and i remember looking at him going who's this old guy man really <laughs> like this guy's never gonna be a pj he's so old <laughs> and we actually ended up going through all the train together and it, it was wild like i was telling you yesterday at first the the indoctrination course our class was a complete dorm like yeah. 125 guys or something right 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 and at the end, and then every week there'd just be less and less and less and less. And you'd get to know one guy or two guys because you ran next to him and then you swam next to him. And then two days later, they're gone. And you're like, whoa, who, where, where'd that guy go, dude? Like, he was the coolest dude. And the next thing you know, we're like just one floor of the dorm. And you kind of get to know the guys. And you're like, all right, cool. These are my dudes. And we're going to make it through the training together. And then. By the time we were done, we were like a little cubby section in this dorm. And yeah. there was four of us left. Jeez. And at a certain point, yeah, dude. And at a certain point, they bring in some guys who got hurt at different points in the training and they're like recycle guys. And yeah. so then our four guys turned into, I think about 14 or 15 guys. And then they helped us because they had been through parts of the training. This is oh, just yeah. in doc. And so they could like tell us what was coming up. And, um, a big thing that helped me get through that training, at least that point, you know, not getting eliminated, would I would just sit in my bunk uh, every, like we get like a break after eating lunch and I would sit in my dorm and I would just imagine myself going through the pool confidence section because that's where we lost everyone. Yeah. Because they would destroy us in the pool. And so I just imagine myself doing all the different things we were supposed to do. And that's what kind of helped me chill out. That's uh, smart, man. Different yeah. Yeah. That visualization. It, yeah. I mean, that, that people talk about with anything like, and that's, that's, that's smart that you had that kind of wherewithal to do that without 
probably being taught that, you know, you're just like, man, this is probably a good idea. That's pretty smart. I think I'd read an article somewhere that like Russian athletes did this visualization before their, uh, events in the Olympics and they could make themselves sweat and like raise their heart rates as if they were really doing the event. I read that somewhere. And so it came back to me when I was going through that training and I was like, Oh, if I can just sit in my bed and I can go through it all in my mind, when I go to do it, it won't be as hard Yeah, because the part that terrified me really was the underwaters because you had to swim back and forth underwater a certain amount of time holding your breath. And then at some point in the training, the instructors would put on scuba gear and they'd wait for you in the deep end. And so you'd cruise to the deep end and they would just pound you, dude, yeah. and pull you underwater. And you just had to relax and let them pull you underwater. And if you didn't fight them, then they would just be like, oh, this is boring. I'm this, this guy's not fighting me. And they'd Perfect. leave you alone. And you could, you know, get to the other end of the pool when you were allowed to come up and take a breath and you could take a breath and then go across and whatever you're supposed to do, all the different water confidence things that that the big thing I was told and know now is that that in doc course is just to get you ready for scuba school. Right. Because scuba school, uh, I don't know if you had any exposure to it, nope. but I guess it has a really high attrition rate. Yeah. And it's an expensive course. And so they the Air Force doesn't want to send people there that are just going to get washed out. It's good, it's and, good thinking. Yeah. 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 And that, that was an amazing time too. Uh, cause Key West, Florida was, I'd never been any place like Key West, Florida. And oh, it was man. a huge, like, it's crazy that they'd have a course like that there. Cause Key West is like a huge party town, like huge, right. <laughs> huge. And I'm just, I'm just shocked that they don't just lose people. It just like, you know, kind of gets sucked into the party scene and never, you never see them again right? because it's so crazy there. And, but you know, there's a little key there. I think they still have it there called Fleming key. And so it's off kind of off of Key West and they had this badass training facility with like submarine mock-ups. And the one thing that always confused me is their dorms were state of the art, but every night when the instructors went home, the air conditioning would stop working. That's probably by design that you think. <laughs> oh, yeah, you cut your ass off all night long, yeah. and then it'd show up in the morning, and you're like, "Oh, the air conditioning's back on." This is so weird. <laughs> Just one more level right. of screwing with Dude, you, you know? Exactly. Like it's not hard enough as it is, you know. And I was, I think I was telling you a little bit too. What was wild, and I didn't know it at the time, we had these badass dudes that just had a weird energy around them. And I found out just by going through the course, they were dudes that had just come back from Somalia and black wow. down. And so like one of the guys that's in the documentary, wow. his name is Ranger Thomas. And they talk about him and he was the yeah. biggest dick out of all of them. He would yell at us air force guys like you young bucks don't deserve to be here. You don't know what we've gone through to be at this course and they'll just send you here. And I had no idea what he was talking about until probably, you know, I don't know how many years later that that um, movie came out. And I was like, oh, that's that dude. <laughs> and I remember wow. some of the, yeah. Because there were some dudes that you, because every, at scuba school, every week you had to run further. And there was these guys that I would never see because we'd start at the beginning of the formation. Well, you had to run in formation too, which was weird. And you mm -hmm. had to sing songs, sing Jody's the whole time. But there were some dudes, I guess, that just want to deal with it. So they would just take off. And they could run by themselves. Really? Like, you know, the yeah. And the huh. first week was like eight miles. And the second week was like, you know, 16 miles. And then it was, um, I got to try to do math, right? Then it was like 24 <laughs> miles. And then the last, the last, dude, seriously. And then the last week you run, like, I don't even know how many miles all around Key West at like three o'clock in the morning. That was another thing. Their sense of time at that school was so fucked up. Cause they would wake you up at all weird hours to go do shit. And you're just like, what, where am I? It was a total trip. So, I mean, they say that's like one of the hardest schools in the military. They say, you know, that's well, above they, everything else. It's just a, this, the worst. The amount that they screwed with you. The big thing there is your dive buddy and you cannot lose your dive buddy. Like, at certain points, which that was another thing they never really told you. So like when you went back to the dorms, of course, you didn't have to like be with your dive buddy. But at a certain point, you had to be with your dive buddy and you didn't always know when it was. And if you couldn't find your dive buddy or if you weren't next to your dive buddy, they had like a certain progression of things they would do. One was like a rope. It was like that. I don't know what it must be from the ships. Yeah, it's yeah. a big, huge rope. I mean, it seems like it, the diameter was like, I don't even know. Yeah. Huge. 
and it had two loops and you had to put one loop around your neck and one loop around your dive buddy's neck. <laughs> and when you were running, when you were doing anything during training, you had to have that thing on. So you wouldn't lose your dive buddy. <laughs> and it progressed. Then there was like a chain, like this huge chain. You had to put that around your neck if you lost your dive buddy again. And then I remember like the last thing was like this huge, um, like, uh, like the boxes they gave us to put all our stuff in. Oh uh, yeah. Like a foot locker or something or. It was a foot locker with sand in it. And it was all decorated from previous people that had to carry this thing with like sharks and octopus and all this crazy shit. And if you fucked up, you had to carry that thing around. I don't even know how <laughs> you could do it, dude. It was so heavy, but I guess it had gotten that bad for people. They had to carry this box around too, dude. You think the rope would be enough to remember? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that was cool with that was, um, uh, they had guys there from every service because at that point, the military was sending every service there, MARSOC, SEALs. Well, no, I don't think SEALs because they had their own training, but for some reason they had SEAL instructors there. Okay. And that's, kind of, that's like the point of the story. I had a SEAL instructor who, for whatever reason, this master sergeant, uh, who was just a badass dude. I don't even know what this guy had done, but oh, he told, he showed me one day he said, yeah, you know, PJs saved my life uh, down in the jungle. And he showed me his leg where he had his parachute didn't open and he frapped in and he lost half his leg. And I guess the PJs that were there did something medically that saved it so that now his leg could get graft back on and he has his leg wow. with the PJs. So when he saw me, I don't know why, he just, maybe I looked like the guy that did it, but he like, he fucked with me really, really hard, but he made sure that I knew what it was. He'd like whisper in my ear, hey, Scardino, do this, do that. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, whatever. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. Yeah, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. Nice. Crazy times, man. Awesome so, times, but crazy times. So you went through, so, okay, so we you got through. So what's your so, progression? Yeah, so, like, I, I don't know the PJ, yeah. like, I don't know the pipeline. Like, so, yeah, so you, this is. It's changed because it's changed I've been through it twice. Oh, right, right. <laughs> But the first time you go to Indoc, and then once you pass Indoc, you have your core group of guys, and it's really cool because then you get in the pipeline and you go to dive school first because you're in the best shape now and you're going to pass dive school. We lost one guy at dive school. Then you go to like water survival school, which was just like a day, but you stay there for a week and you're traveling with all your buddies all over the place. Uh. So you, you, the stories and the shit that happens when you have a group of like 20 somethings. And they give you rental cars and they give you a lot of responsibility to go to all these different classes and you just do it. You know, it, it's really, it, it's not like that now, but oh, then you go to water survival school. And I think the next one was airborne school, but I'd already been to airborne school. And so they sent me back to Davis Monthan. And when I got there, it was really, it was like, it was a glitch in the system because there was no unit there for me, but like, oh, you know, Scardino used to be attached to this unit. So uh, because he's already been to airborne school. And then I think, think the next one was survival school. He's like, we're yeah, just yeah. going to send him back to this month in, and he can be part of his unit until it's time to join again. And when I showed up, the first Sergeant was like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> he's like, all right, well fill out this leave paperwork. I'm going to put it on my desk. You take off and do whatever you want to do because you PJs, you know, even at that point I was just a trainee, but yeah. he was like, you PJs are crazy and good dudes and you're trustworthy. So just go what you want, do what you want to do. And then in a month, come back. And if you haven't gotten in any trouble, I'll just throw away your leave paperwork and you can join your unit again. And so for a nice. month, yeah, I went on, I got a car and went home and what well, anyway. So then the guys got done with that training and I met them in North Carolina for halo school. Okay. So high altitude, low opening. And the, at that time, Halo school uh, was at Fort Bragg, which I knew from the training that you and I had done. And um, the big thing there was the wind tunnel. Yeah. And you have to go through a couple of weeks of training in the wind tunnel before they sent us out to Yuma, Arizona to actually do the jumps. Right. Because the weather out there is really good. They used to do the jumps in at Fort Bragg, but the weather was so uh, questionable, was so like volatile all the time that a lot of times classes we're like right down to the wire trying to get their 30 jumps yeah, to yeah. pass the core. But out of Yuma, it's always sunny. Right, right. I went out there and we did all our jumps and that was crazy, dude. I mean, I had, <laughs> had some exposure to skydiving because when we were in at Davis Month and I'd go out to Marana and I had like right. a student 
I had like an A license, but I didn't tell um, anyone at the Halo school that I had a license. I just showed up there and did my thing. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And that was that course was brutal because you were if you weren't jumping, you were packing your parachutes, and I, your hands would just be tore up from just trying to pack these parachutes the way they want you to pack them. And there's someone that's coming over and checking every time you're at a certain point packing them. Uh, and they don't do that anymore. Now I think when you go to the course, they just hand you a parachute. Oh, is that right? And they and I was told that PJs now go to a course that's uh, in San Diego, and I think it's a Navy course. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I have heard about that. So, yeah, which I think is a shame because you really learn your equipment and appreciate your equipment because you were packing your own parachute in between oh, yeah. jumps. Yeah, uh, when I went that, had the opportunity to go through later on, and that I went through the oh, same deal. I went to North Carolina for the wind tunnel, and then out to Yuma. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, uh, what yeah. What did you think it, of the wind tunnel, dude? I loved it. I thought it was so fun, man. It was like, uh, I was like, this is work. We're working today. I thought it was great. I don't know how you felt, but it was like, cause you get in there and there's like a bunch of you and then, you know, you, you fall out and you go on the pads and then, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I never yeah. experienced anything like that before in my life. I'm like, it was crazy. And that well, kind of to your point about, uh, Yuma being crazy. Also you go to the wind tunnel and then they're like, all right, go, go to Yuma. And that's like day one. They're like, all right, get your shoot on. You're going to jump today. I'm like, Oh wait, Here. I'm not, I'm jumping today. I, I'm not ready to jump right now. You know, <laughs> like, what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. Was I was crazy. lucky. I th yeah. I was lucky. Oh, cause you'd already been that. skydiving. So it was easy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I literally yeah, guys like us never... were like, what I, my, what I'm going, what am I doing today? And I, my first one, I like came out and I had my feet tucked and I did a complete flip. And the guy was like, you know, it was, it was a mess. It was a mess. Oh man. I got super lucky at that class because I got an Air Force CCT guy as my instructor. Nice. And he knew right away. He's like, "Oh, you've jumped out of planes before. Like you you know how to skydive." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, I have an A license." He's like, "Okay." And I had a fucked up altimeter. And so it's not seriously, good. I had a broken altimeter, and oh. so I kept pulling I kept pulling too low. Really? And he was like, "Dude, he, and he would get so he would get so mad at me. He's like, "Dude, what the fuck are you doing, bro? I know you know how to do this. Why are you pulling so low?" And I'm like, "Dude, I'm just watching my altimeter." And so finally, he jumped my altimeter, and I jumped his. And he's like, "So pull at the right altitude, and I'm gonna pull at the altitude that the altimeter tells me to pull at." And I remember pulling and looking down and watching him go for a long ass time, and then finally he'd pull. And he's like, all right. He goes, I think I believe you. And he, and he took and he, he, took <laughs> he thinks he believes you. Yeah. It's like, what do you mean, right? dude? You just did it. I know. And so he <laughs> took the altimeters to that machine where you can like test them. Yeah. And yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, your altimeter is way fucked up. But normally, I, if I would have had an army guy or a marine guy or a seal, I would have been taken out of the course, dude. Yeah. Because I, pulled, yeah, they wouldn't have put up with it. They'd have been like, you're not doing the right thing. You're out of here. Man, how lucky. That's but that's I also guess, super yeah. dangerous, dude. Because we didn't have like we had those, what would we jump FF twos then. It wasn't Cypress at that time. It was like that mechanical, whatever it was. Yeah, man. Just think if that would have fired you. Would have really been in trouble, dude. It was this crazy shit. I remember. Uh, I don't know if they were doing it when you were there, but the instructors were dump were jumping sport parachutes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were doing regular parachutes, and right. so. At that time, we did a night jump, and the guy was like, okay, I'm going to have a chem light, or I'm going to have a blinking light. And so when you get done, and you guys are all coming down your formation, follow me. And he took us on this weird route one time, and none of us made it back to the drop zone because oh, no. he had the penetration. Yeah. And we didn't. And so I remember just turning and seeing a road, and I'm like, I'm gonna, I don't want to land in any of the cactus out yeah. there, so I'm going to land on the road. And I just remember sparks and shit flying as I go down the road. And I remember he came back and apologized to us all. He's like, dude, I'm so sorry. You're right. I have a sport canopy and I can make it back. And I totally fucked you guys. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Crazy shit. Crazy shit. Uh, and so then once you get done with all your pipeline, which I think Halo is the last one, you go back to New Mexico. And really that's where the training starts. I was going to say, first. yeah. So you get to New Mexico and um, which I think was wild because I went back to I went back to Davis Monthan to get my stuff. And then a couple of my buddies who were PJ trainees were going to drive from California because they were in the Air National Guard. So they got to go home and grab their stuff at home. And they came and met me at Davis Monthan. And then we drove out to Kirtland Air Force Base together. And I just got to Kirtland Air Force Base in the middle of the night. 
and was like, whoa, where the fuck is this place, man? And they have a tradition out there where when new trainees show up on the first day, they send students go over to the hotel rooms and grab the guys and do like a welcoming party for pararescue trainees. And so like I showed up, I'm putting all my stuff in my hotel room and I'm thinking, cool, you know, we, training starts in a week. I got time to chill out. And next thing I know, there's this guy in my room with a beret on and a flight suit. And he's like, come with me. And I'm like, okay. And they took us out in the desert. And now we're at like, I'm coming from, from the desert. Uh, it's like Davis Monthan, which is like, I don't know, maybe 500 or a thousand feet, something like that yeah. to New Mexico, which is like it over a mile high. And they know that too. And they take you out and run you into the ground and then throw you in the, in this pool. And then they take you out for like, it can be 12 hours. It can be whatever, however long the, the student wants to, unless until he gets bored, but they just take you out and fuck with you. And the whole time you think this is an instructor. And then they bring you back to the dorms where all the rest of the PJs are. And they like throw a barbecue for you and say, welcome to pararescue. And you're like, are you kidding me, dude? Like, this is, this is what I'm in for. <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, it's a tradition that they had. And then, uh, I went back a second time and the second time they started doing it again, but it, because now the course is uh, governed by AC, Air Force Training and Education. AETC, yeah. Uh, they couldn't do that anymore. And so when I went back, they started doing it again, but it was up, like, it was sanctioned. So you met oh, okay. in the park and anyway, and you did all this stuff and then welcome the new guys. Anyways, uh, yeah. So then you go to um, Kirtland and you start with paramedic school. Uh, which was at that time taught by instructors. And it, was, it wasn't it was a great course uh, because if you ask questions and the instructor didn't know the answer, he'd just make you do push-ups. Like, <laughs> you know, because you're like exposing him or something. I don't know, dude. It was, right. it was so it was tough. It was really tough. I yeah. had taken an EMT course at Davis Monthan. Uh, I don't know if you did it too or somehow, maybe it was Ron. Like it might've been Ron who said, bro, you're going to have to go through paramedic school and it's going to be gnarly. You should get a head start and uh, get your EMT. And I went through the EMT thing for a couple of weeks and passed and it did help. Good. Uh, but when you got to pararescue training, you basically start over again and go through EMT and through paramedic. It's about, I don't know how many months of school. And then you go straight into your clinical rotations and you start riding on ambulances. And then at one point you come back and you take the national registry you know, uh, EMT paramedic course or exam, which at that time was like a whole day. The morning you did all the, um, like practical skills of like starting IVs and doing all the stuff a paramedic would do. And then in the afternoon you take the test oh. and 70% is passing. And I got a 71. So <laughs> hey, it counts. Dude. That and counts. I was a knucklehead and I didn't fill out the form where you you say if you're a felon or not. Like I just left it blank. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> and so everyone got their test results back and a bunch of guys, like more than half didn't pass. And so uh -huh. they were going to be like EMT eyes where they were like an EMT, but they could start an IV. And with me, they got to my name. They're like, fucking Scardino, just drop, dude. And so I'm like doing pushups. I'm like, what is going on? He's like, dude. You didn't fill your application out right. He's like, here, mark whether you're a felon or not. I'm like, uh, not a felon. And then, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, one of the instructors came to the dorm and was like, congratulations, Scardino, you're a paramedic, but just barely. <laughs> <laughs> and so at a certain point, you know, you go through paramedic. Then they had like a mountain phase where they teach you all the skills of like how to climb and how to do um, like all kinds of systems to pull people off of rocks or low pe lower people down and, you know, all the mechanical advantage stuff. And you do that, which was awesome. Yeah. Um, how to make, um, you know, how to make a anchor uh, safely out of like, you know, use like picks and stuff in the ground and how to make it all so that it's all safe. And then you do like a navigation phase where you go out and spend a couple of weeks just learning how to, you know, walk all over the place, which was awesome because TACP got me ready for that. So sure. that wasn't really tough. Um, and then there's like a, a weapons phase, which was really cool because uh -huh. you went to Nellis Air Force Base and they had all these weapons from all around the world. So you got to learn how to shoot weapons from different um, countries. And uh, 
Oh, what else, dude? Um, and then I think the last thing is air operations phase. And that's where they teach you how to do all the stuff in the helicopters and jump out of planes. And then at a certain point, you go to Florida and you do all the water jumps. Uh, a big thing in pararescue oh, okay. at that time in the 90s was the Rams package. And uh, hmm. it's like rapid alternate method Zodiac. And it's still used okay. and it was designed for... Um, Space shuttle recovery. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. So they said, you know, Challenger explosion, astronauts were still alive when they hit the water and there was no way to rescue them. Or at least their space suits were sending back telemetry that they still had, you know, heartbeats and they were still breathing. Okay. Uh, and I've been told that they possibly drowned. Some of the astronauts were still alive and they possibly oh, drowned man. because there was no way to get so the Air Force got together with NASA. Yeah, they got together with NASA and they came up with this way to recover the astronauts. I have no idea how an astronaut's going to get out of their seat and get to the door of the space shuttle. And then there's like a pole that was supposed to extend out the side. And this astronaut is going to now do a static line jump off of the space shuttle. That was their <laughs> way. And then, yeah. Wow. I saw the videos. I saw the videos. I'm like, this is going to be real interesting if this ever happens. Yeah. But that was another part of Pararescue that was so fun, Jared. They would send us to uh, Spain, like 19 of us. Yeah, 19 of us. They'd send us to Spain. We'd go to Rota, Spain, where there's like a big international base. We had like three or four or five Rams packages there, uh, which is the Zodiac. It's all folded up a certain way and you suck all the air out of it. And then there's a motor. It's like a Johnson OMD 35, you know, horsepower engine that can go underwater. It's a badass engine and fuel. And then any kind of equipment you think you're going to need uh, with redundancy so that you don't lose it just in case the package, you know, malfunctions. But you have like stuff in there, food, water. And <clears throat> they had three of them on each plane and the planes would split up. These C-130s would split up. And depending on the inclination that the space shuttle was going to take off high, medium, or low, they had positions they'd put PJs. Uh, it seemed like it was always a medium inclination. So one team of guys would always go to Zaragoza, Spain. And then I always went to Marrakesh, Morocco. Wow. Uh, which was amazing. Yeah. And we would, they'd always send a, a space shuttle commander that was going to be on the next mission. Uh, they sent a couple of them with us and they would break up and they'd come with us and we'd ask them all kinds of crazy questions like how fast does a space shuttle really go? And right. It doesn't make any sense, dude. Yeah. All the physics and all the stuff that, you know, going into space. Yeah. It's crazy. It's not like, it's, crazy. it's not like it just like launches from the earth and goes up. It's, I mean, cause the earth's spinning and the curvature of the earth and they got to like go along. Yeah. It's, it's bananas. Dude. Bleh. I don't even know, dude. It's so <laughs> right. cool. And then when you're done, when you're done with that like week and the shuttle launches and everything's cool, uh, then they would pay for us to go do what's called adverse terrain training. So in the summertime, we'd go up in the mountains around Granada, Spain, and we'd go rock climbing and practice all the skills for recovery people off of rocks. In the wintertime, we'd go up in the mountains and of the Sierra Nevadas above Granada, Spain, and we'd go do like um, snow caves and backcountry skiing and like how to rescue people in the snow and if they've gone over a cliff and how to get them back up and throw them into a cave and keep them warm and that's awesome go do and yeah when the train was done then we get to go snowboard or just have a crazy time and you you know again i'm a young man i'm with a bunch of studs and we're just having traveling around the world having a great time and doing a really cool mission yeah uh, I, I, my first deployment was to, um, uh, Saudi Arabia and it was Southern watch. So it was after the war was over with Iraq, but we were still enforcing no fly zones in the North and the South. Right. And so they had PJs in different spots, just in case the American aircraft that was helping patrol, if any of those pilots had an issue and had to punch out, we were there to, to rescue them. Okay. So we had a package then that was a uh, quad runner um, and it had, it was like a Rams package, but with a quad runner and it was, had parachutes on it and had all kinds of equipment on it and we could push it out 
we'd skydive after it, land next to it, and then set up a fighting position is what we were told. We we're going to set up a fighting position. They'd bring in a shit ton of aircraft to just blow apart whatever was in our way. We could go out and pick up the people, bring them back, treat them, and then they'd bring in a helicopter and get us out of there. And then we could, you know, that, that was our plan. That's awesome. So I did that. For, yeah, I did that for a few months. Um, it was right after. I, I just, a wild story is I just missed um, being involved in the Kobar uh, tower bombing. My oh, really? Team, yeah. My team at that time was doing the rotation. And <clears throat> my girlfriend, who became my first wife, came to visit. And there was a big party. And she met my chief. And I guess she told my chief, yeah, I'm just out here to visit Sundance. And I was supposed to stay longer. But now he's going to be deployed. And, you know, she was all bummed about it. And so when I came into work that Monday, my chief was like, hey, dude, don't worry about this next deployment. We got plenty of pups going on it. And, you know, your girlfriend talked to me and it's important. Family's important. And you should stay with, you know, I heard you guys are going to hang out for a month and that's, I want that to happen. So don't worry about this next deployment. You'll be on the next one. And we got plenty of pups. And I remember just talking to the guys, telling me their stories about that whole bombing incident. Like guys, you know, literally were when the bomb went off. Well, first of all, my buddies were telling me that before they were there, before they did the bombing, that they knew they were being probed because they were seeing all kinds of weird shit going on. Man. And so the story that I heard was that, you know, it was a water truck filled with gasoline, the huge bomb, tried to get on base. The the patrol or the you know gate guard people did their job, turned it away because it didn't have the right credentials. Yeah. So it already had other places that it knew uh, were weak points and it parked the truck where the fence was the closest to buildings. And when it went off, what I was told um, saved the building that my guys were in from completely going down to the ground was there, those cement Jersey barriers were around yeah. the buildings and it deflected the main wave and it took off the front of the building, but it didn't level the building. And so Man, my guys lucky. were, dude, my guys were on, I think the third or fourth floor. And my buddy said that like he, um, he went to the bathroom just before the explosion on like the third floor or the fourth floor and woke up like two floors down or one. Floor oh my down. God. Yeah. None of our guys got killed, but they all were like in different places at different times and experienced it in different ways. One guy said he was on the phone with the guys back in Florida and looked over and saw the window suck out and he was like whoa that's not right and then the window came back and was blown out and he, he just he looked at the the computer because on the computer and he watched the computer fly across the room stuff fly, and then he was going flying across the room oh my god yeah Jeez. So i just missed that which is cool uh but i was on the next rotation after that which was wild because uh they basically moved everyone out into the desert to this place that was called like King Sultan Al Karj something something Air Force Base. And we just called it Al's Garage. <laughs> and it was a uh, Quonset huts and like it was like Mad Max, dude. We were out yeah. there driving around our quad runners. You had to, we had to trade with people to try to get certain stuff to get set up because they were setting up a new place there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that just for sure because it was safer out there? So you could like see come somebody coming from way out yeah okay yeah i guess you know it was out in the middle of nowhere um yeah and that that's the picture that i sent you with all of us on that patriot missile oh yeah yeah um, and we're all in desert camis yeah yeah that was wild that was my first deployment to like an actual like it wasn't a combat zone because we weren't you know at war but it was like a i don't know it was an operation whatever that means i don't know yeah i mean you might as well been i mean it's you're still it's it's a dangerous place i mean it's not like you're on vacation or whatever or in the state yeah. somewhere. I mean, yeah, it's you're still in harm's way. Yeah. at some, you know, in yeah. some way. We went. They wouldn't to, have patriots uh, there if you weren't. I mean, frankly, yeah. you know. <laughs> right. I mean, and we went to uh, Bahrain at one point in the training because we were going to jump with the Bahrainian forces or something, and uh, that was a wild experience because Bahrain is like Las Vegas of the Middle East, and oh, really? what I've been told, yeah, what I've been told is like. Muslims believe that Allah cannot see them in Bahrain. <laughs> and so there's Muslim people there that are just crazy, off the hook, drunk, throwing up, 
stumbling around. Uh, and there's a huge military presence. So you have military guys there that are on leave. Uh, it was great. I ran into, I ran into special forces guys that I had been at dive school with oh, okay. just in the street. We were just getting shawarma, you know, which we shouldn't have, I guess, cause the, you know, it's street food. You're going to get sick, but it tasted so good. <laughs> so we were like, you know, drunk and getting, um, beef shawarma in the streets. And I ran into this guy, Wojak, who I went to dive school with. I was like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, what are you doing, bro? And so, of course we really couldn't talk about what we were doing, but it was cool. Right. Right. <laughs> Small world. You know, that's community. awesome. The military that is, that's crazy. Cool. Yeah. And that jump was crazy too. Cause the winds were way out of limits, but it was like, we're going to do this jump with them. And they, Bahrainian guys all did static line jumps. I just remember the smell of fear. Those right. guys were, oh, they were petrified, petrified <laughs> fear. And then, and we were all, ha, 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 you know, we've done this. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and then we went up to a higher altitude, but when we got down on the ground, the winds were smoking. I mean, I remember looking down and seeing the, the, the smoke grenade that's supposed to be our marker. And it's just, you, it's not really even putting out smoke because the wind's blowing so hard. It's just hard dissipating it's, immediately. <laughs> Jeez. And I came down. Yeah. I yeah. Came how was the landing? Was, Dude, it was it was basically a static line landing because I came yeah. down, I turned into the wind, and I just started going backwards. Oh, and I was like, oh, this is gonna hurt, dude. And I just kind of <laughs> put my feet and knees together and just boom, 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 and then got up and tried <laughs> to run around the canopy so I didn't get drug, and that was crazy. So and and then um, my career then kind of just changed. I remember at a certain point, I was like, I uh, talked to some buddies. They're like, you should become a firefighter with your paramedic certification. You're a shoe in to get hired by the fire department. Cause at that time they were looking for paramedics. Uh, and I went out to Moffett field and became a part-time PJ. So I moved out to California and I started taking uh, tests with the fire department. And <clears throat> uh, at one point, LA County fire, was giving a, a, you know, a test or doing a, you know, recruitment. And I remember one of my buddies totally saved my ass. Again, this guy, Will Wingert, who I met at, you know, the first day of Indoc, we went through all the training together. And then we were one of the original four guys out of our class that graduated together. He went out to Moffett Field. And so I kept in touch with him. And at a certain point, he's like, you got to come out to Moffett Field, be a PJ, and then be a firefighter. He's like, it's the perfect gig because you're only working 10 days a month as a firefighter and you can keep up on all your skills of being a part-time PJ and it's a really good lifestyle. So I went out there and, uh, when I turned in my application because of will, he said, dude, make sure you turn in your DD 214 with your application. And, uh, because we were in basic training during desert storm, it gave you veterans credit points. Oh, and okay. when I took my test, I got over a hundred percent on the test. And I remember when the package showed up, I was all bummed because it said V with an asterisk next to it. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm a knucklehead, man. I got band five. Because <laughs> at that time, what they did is they break up your test scores into bands. Yeah. And band one is what you want to be in, which is like, you know, 100% down to maybe 92% because that you're going to get hired first. Oh, okay. Well, when I saw the V and the asterisk, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm knucklehead. But then when I saw my score... It was like 101.025, whatever. And because of the 10 veterans points, I got over 100%, which put me in the veterans band. Oh, okay. So the V wasn't five, it was veteran. Veteran, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a whole other cool experience where you're basically like back at basic training again, but it's for the fire department. Because uh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to that in any way, but that's like, again. That's Never. Like I want to hear about it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 18 weeks of training. Uh, it was it was 51 guys that are all veterans from all the different services, all ethnicities, which was really cool because we all had really cool stories to share with each other. And we kind of broke up in like rank. We had a guy who was a colonel. And so he kind of took over for us to be our class leader. And he was amazing. This guy was amazing because uh, he would just find out everything that was going to happen and just kept us kind of ahead of the game. It was super hot. We trained in uh, Los Angeles during the summertime. I think our training started in like, I don't know, I want to say it was like April or May and it was just smoking hot. And, it, you know, I, I had never lived in the city, so I had to deal with like trying to commute in and get home yeah. and 
train center was in a really like busy location. So you, you had to be there at six o'clock in the morning. So I'm getting up at like four o'clock. It felt like I was back in the military again. Oh I was my getting gosh. Up at four, commuting. And then, you know, all day long, you're in and out of um, your turnouts. And basically all a turnout is, is a vapor barrier. So it might help you against the heat, but if you're sweating, it's just dripping off of you, dude. <laughs> and you're just, you know, running around, throwing ladders and tying knots and pulling hose off the engine and, you know, pretending there's a fake fire and opening up fire hydrants and just doing all this skills for 18 weeks. And we lost about 10 or 15 guys. Um, 18 they, weeks. That's a long time. My goodness. Dude, it was forever, bro. And they do night fires so like on friday night you wouldn't get home until two or three o'clock in the morning because they would keep you later and then they take these big concrete buildings and uh put all these pallets and stuff inside of them and uh do these mock fires wow so were you wearing like all the gear or like were you just wearing the the, so all like the big coat and the hat and all that stuff man the boots man oh man like you know the scbas and They'd set the fire and then you do the certain skills you're supposed to do, like throw ladders and do all the stuff. And then at a certain point, an instructor would grab you and you'd go inside this building and low crawl with your hose line. And then he'd have you spray a little bit of water on the fire just to see what it does. But he didn't want to put it out because he wants the next group to be able to see it and do it. And uh-huh. Wow. One time was wild, dude. Uh, we're all doing all this stuff like we're supposed to. We're broke up in groups. They take a break one of the stations was a car fire. And so the first car fire was all the, you know, contents, the seats, everything, it burnt out. And then, you know, the guys came in and put it out and, you know, yay, you did your job. (laughs) Second iteration, which was what I was on, they put a bunch of pallets and wood inside the car because they need something to burn. And the instructor, I remember seeing him, like he had his turnouts open, he had his helmet off. And he's like dumping gasoline all inside of it and stuff and getting it all ready. And then at one point they're like, okay, you guys get all your gear on. We're going to, you know, go do our next, you know, iteration, our next round of training. And I see the guy has a, uh, like a, uh, a, um, a flare in his hand and he stands away from the car and he chucks the flare in the car, but because of the, there's so much fuel, it doesn't light. Oh no. And so he walks over and he's still, he's got his turnouts on, but he has no helmet on. He just got, and he's got his jacket open. He grabs the flare. And as he walks away from the vehicle and the concentration gets right, you could see, I saw the flame come from the vehicle to his hand. And then I saw the fire go up over his back. Oh my and God. Then big, Whoa! And then he's got <laughs> knocked on his, he got knocked on his face. And all of us ran over there and we're on top of him and we're trying to put him out. But the, the gases had gotten inside his turnouts. Oh no. So When you put your hand on him, you could make the fire go away. But the minute you moved your hand away, the concentration got right again with the oxygen and the gas and he'd start flaming up again. Now he wasn't on fire. He didn't get burns really on inside him. He got some burns around his face and I think he had sucked in some heated gases, but he ended up being okay. Oh, but I remember that geez. was like one of the first, yeah, that was one of the first really intense moments of being a firefighter. They brought out counselors and. Like, and that was in training. I mean, you're like, if this is happening in training, I can't imagine like real world stuff, you know? It didn't, you know, it never really clicked. It never really clicked uh, until much, 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 much later in my career. What seeing all this stuff and experiencing the smells and the col- and the colors and the sounds, what it means. Yeah. Uh, and then you know I was a, I was so I was a firefighter down there. It was fully like you know Squad Fifty One, like you see on TV. Like I was in a paramedic squad. I sent you that picture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're in Gardena, which was uh, what LA County was doing at the time. Was it was like the Borg. It was like assimilating cities. So <laughs> okay. like a city, yeah, a city would have its own fire department, but at a certain point. Their budget couldn't allow them to have their own fire department. So LA County would come in and say, hey, we can be your fire department and we can do it for less because we have all these, um, you know, stations around your city. Right. So we can put less people in those stations because we have backup. And so I was 
working at Gardena, like right when LA County took over Gardena. Huh. And it was like the wild west there because Gardena is kind of like the eye of the storm because you have, it's a, it's a decent city, but all around it, you have like Compton, Inglewood, uh, Carson city, all these other cities around it that are lower income. So it was crazy because oh. when you're on a paramedic squad at that time, there's, there's, there's fire engines that are only with EMTs. And so they are like the initial front line that go out to a call. And then myself and another guy would be on the paramedic squad. And then we would start hauling ass towards them. And then they would get there and triage. And then if they're like, okay, this is a ALS call, they would continue us. But if it was a BLS call, they could handle, they would cancel us. And if oh, they okay. didn't know, yeah. And if they didn't know, they would just have us continue in. And then we could show up and triage and talk to the captain. And we'd decide, hey, does this person need to go to the hospital? Or can they just, you know, they don't need to go to the hospital. They're going to sign out AMA or against medical advice or, or whatever. So yeah. in the midst of all that too, you'd get fires. And so that was a whole nother scene because it was like you were trying to beat other people to the fires. <laughs> and it was, it was a really cool time to kind of learn how to be a firefighter. Sure. Uh, nothing like I thought it was, um, to all kinds of crazy shit going on as far as like, I'm a funny story. Uh, we got a fire. It was at a hotel that was now like people had bought it out. And so it was like little, little, not really condos, but you can buy your hotel room. So okay. we knew about it and it was kind of run down because of the fact that each person kind of owned their own thing. So we knew it was like, man, this place is going to be a death trap if there's a fire there. And one, our, one of our partners was on a uh, vacation. So we had a, a brand new rookie firefighter who was on the fire engine. Oh. And then my buddy and I, his name is, his name was Brian Lavasser. And we called him shark because his teeth were all fucked up like a shark. <laughs> he bit into a donut once. And when he pulled his mouth away from the donut, it looked like a shark had bitten into the donut. So we're like, dude, <laughs> your nickname is shark from now on. And he, 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 Always had braces after that, but they were always fucked up. His teeth were always fucked up. He was awesome, dude. Yeah, he was an awesome paramedic partner, dude. Uh, and so we went to this fire, and we knew it was at the hotel, and we were out on a different call. So we got there way before the fire engine, and so we got all our stuff on. And our job as you know, being on the on the squad was we're search and rescue. So of course we're not going to go into a burning building, but we could do the initial like. Hey, get out, get out, get out. And so we're going around to this, uh, you know, condo, but it's like an old hotel and we're like knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. Hey, get out. There's a fire. Get out. There's a fire. Get out. There's a fire. And like the main room that was on fire on either side, we're trying to get the people out and no one's coming to the door. And so my buddy and I look at each other like, okay, we're going to, you know, go hero style. We're going to kick open the door. And so like, yeah. I step back, blow open my door. And there's no one in there. And I look over my shoulder. I see Shark, and he's got his foot stuck in the door. So he kicked oh, through the door, but his foot went through the door. Oh, and no. Like, Scardino, dude, help, help. And so I come <laughs> over there, and like I'm trying to pull him out of the door. And when we pull the person out of the door, there's this huge black guy. Like his head is kind of like, what the hell are you guys doing? We're like, dude, it's on fire next to you. And he's like, opens the door. He's like, you know, the door was open, dude. You're not going to kick open my fucking door. <laughs> anyway, it's it funny. And then, you know, the fire engine shows up and the rookie guy doesn't have his equipment on like he's supposed to. So Brian and I grab the hose line and like start putting out the fire. And then the rookie comes up and we give him the hose line and total shenanigans, dude. Like That's not... awesome. Yeah, dude. It was a great time. And then um, at a certain point, uh, my ex-wife and I decided we didn't like Los Angeles anymore. So we moved like back to, we moved to Santa Cruz and, uh, I started trying to get jobs up there. And at one point I got a job with San Jose fire. Uh, so I basically started over again where I had to go through, uh, an academy, an 18 week academy, but I had eight years of experience what? again. Uh, yeah, Crazy. A lot of fire, I think a lot of fire departments, they don't want the liability that, okay, this guy's telling us he knows what he's doing, but if he gets hurt or he hurts someone else, do we train him? So yeah, I had that's to a good go point. Another, yeah, I had to go through another training academy. 
uh, which was, you know, it was hard work, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. And I had already been a firefighter for seven, almost eight years. So I knew what I was doing, but you know, it's had to be yeah. real humble, you know, and try to help people when I could, uh, cause I'd already done it. Um, and then, uh, at a certain point I, I got divorced and, uh, was at the climbing gym cause I wanted to get into climbing cause I knew it was a healthy thing for my mind. And I ran into a guy who I'd been on the pararescue team with. Uh, but I hadn't seen him in years. And I, and he was like, you're divorced now. I'm like, yeah. He's like, dude, this is perfect time for you to get back in the military. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Dude, I'm almost 40 years old. He's like, no, dude, you're in <laughs> shape. You can do it. Like come back to pararescue. And I was like, I miss jumping out of planes. That'd be fun. You know, I to, and I was like, I'd love to go through the train again and find out what the latest and greatest is. So yeah, I came over to the, the team that I had been a part of, um, 12 years before. And a lot of the guys had stayed in, they became officers, uh, because, uh, pararescue kind of reorganized itself and became guardian angel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by doing that, they had their own, um, structure, their own, uh, leadership and they had officers now, uh, that were combat rescue officers. And yeah. so it was a totally different feel. Uh, and it was, it was cool, man. And so I really didn't know what I was doing, but I figured this will be fun. And I, <laughs> I went back to the apprenticeship course and, uh, wow, I'm back at, back at, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base and I'm not 24, but now I'm 39 and, uh, wait, so they didn't make you go through like in doc again or anything, or did you have to go through in doc no. again? Luckily, no, um, you know, I took all the physical fitness tests and I passed them all. And then my unit, uh, got me spun up on, uh, jumping out of planes again, scuba diving, land nav they put me through like a makeshift like survival thing where they basically just came out and grabbed me when i was out doing a i was out doing a land nav they grabbed me uh duct taped my hands and feet threw me in the back of a car and drove <laughs> me around until i figured out how to get my hands and my feet free and then i, I passed the survival <laughs> part <laughs> and so the, that's you awesome know, we went, yeah dude and then we uh i went you know, back to the apprenticeship course, which was six months. And, um, dude, day one, uh, I guess the senior team was in, uh, Melbourne, uh, back at like doing water ops, doing water jumps. And one of the PJ trainees got accused of raping, uh, a female officer. That was the story oh, we had yeah. heard. And <clears throat> so I'm brand new dude. So I'm kind of out of place. I mean, you know, the story's not in the order, but, uh, I'm brand new there. I'm showing up. I haven't been in the military in like 13 years, but I've got all the stuff I'm supposed to have. You know, I got the right haircut and everything. And I show up on a Friday and like, you know, your training starts in a week, but we're probably going to have a commander's call today. So here's your guy who's in charge of you. Go talk to him. I go talk to him. He's like, yeah, you know, we're gonna do a commander's call. I don't know if you need to be there or not. They usually last like a half an hour. Don't worry about it. What do you got to do? I'm like, oh, I, my girlfriend's coming into town. I'm going to go pick her up at the airport and take her to my apartment because I was fortunate enough that they weren't going to put me on base. Um, I go pick up my wife, who's my girlfriend at the time, Amber. I sent you a picture of her. Yeah, yeah. She's a sweetheart, dude. I pick her up at the airport. I take her back to my apartment. I get a phone call. Hey, you got to come for commander's call. There's nothing in my apartment but boxes. I'm like, hey, babe, you know, hang out for a while. I'll be back in a half an hour or so. She's like, okay, no problem. And I show up and something's wrong, dude. Luckily, I put on my uniform. Luckily, I looked like I was supposed to. They've got the whole training, everybody. All the classes are all in formation. And so I kind of show up and I see the guy who's in charge of me and I look at him and he looks kind of worried. I'm like, what's going on, dude? He's like, just, you know, stand in formation. Don't worry about it. And we find out, hey, you guys are a bunch of fuck ups. And they, the commander just starts going off and pulling people up to the front of the formation that have gotten in trouble for you know, DUIs or stealing or all the different infractions. And then I start looking to the sides, dude. And I start seeing fire hoses coming out. I'm like, Oh dude, like this is going to be a huge slam session. Like they're going to fuck with us hard. And about that time, some guys come up to me that I was in training with back in the nineties and they've gone through their whole careers and now they're civilians and they're teaching, you know, they're part of the training course. Like, hey, Scardino. They're like, slap me on the back. <laughs> Welcome back to Pararescue. Now drop. And like for the <laughs> next five hours, we did calisthenics and got fire hoses sprayed on us. And 
I got really unlucky and like the biggest guy in our team was next to me. So I got to fireman carry him back. And oh, forth. Geez. I passed out. I passed out three times. What? I was all, oh, dude, I was all bleeding and scraped up. And after five hours, I come home and Amber's like, where have you been? Like, she's pissed. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is the shit that just went down. And she's like, you're bleeding. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, you're going to do this for six months. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, let's go to the liquor store. I got to get five bags of ice. I got like a bag of ice for each shoulder for my knees. And I put one like across my back. I got in the tub. Oh. And so I would do that. Like every Friday, I would be fucked up from training. And I would just go grab my ice and a six pack of beer. And I just listen to country music. And like, you, man, you're, that's something else. Over? I can't believe you. When you told me that, I, I think I heard about that. I think because I follow you on Facebook and stuff. And I, I think I saw your, this whole thing play out. And when you said you were going back to PJ training, I, I was like, first of all, I was impressed. I mean, obviously, I mean, that's something that's a phenomenal thing to do. But man, that's some brave shit, too. Oh, my God. It was crazy. <laughs> my call sign, you know, your call sign is supposed to be like your first and last initial of your last name, right? Right, right. I guess Sierra Oscar. That's how they did it. And so right away, they're like, no, 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 no. Your call sign is gray balls. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was uh, cool because I had been through training before. So I knew I could do it. Yeah. Um, and I got to be a mentor for a lot of people, which was, you know, I didn't know I was doing it at the time. It's not like I was trying to do it, but that's what I did. And it was, it was really valuable for me uh, you know, made me feel young again. And sure. I got retrained and, you know, figured out all the new stuff. The medical stuff had just light years ahead of what, you know, I'd been doing. We, cause we learned how to like, uh, because of the war, right. Because of Afghanistan, we were getting trained by PJs who had been in Afghanistan. Nice. And they, and they were at the training facility because they needed a break. They had yeah. been on so many fucking deployments, man. They needed a break. And I didn't tell him I had been a PJ before. I just showed up just like everyone else, ran back and forth in the schoolhouse like I was supposed to, and just kept quiet. Um, that's smart, though. I mean, that's the, that's the way to do it. Because the minute you say, oh, I've done all this before, now, even if you, even if they're like, okay, cool, you, it, like you said, everything's changed. So, you know, you, yeah, you did the right thing, man. You're, and you're a humble guy anyway. So that's, I yeah, just, that's the same way with the fire department, you know, in San Jose. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Just, I, don't, I didn't tell anybody the stuff that I'd done. Nobody knows what pararescue is or gets it or anything. So I just show up humble and learn. And I think that's my superpower, I guess, is that I, I have a student. I've been told before by other people, like I have a student's mind or a student mind setting or whatever. And so I'll just, you know, hey, it's time to learn. I, I think I know some of this stuff, but I'll, I might learn something new if I'm just quiet and 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 learn. So sure. one thing that happened, though, was like the very first day that the the two staff sergeants, which, again, I'm I'm 39 and the next closest <laughs> person to me is 23 years old and he's a staff sergeant. Right. He doesn't yeah. know anything about. Me. And so like they they call this like team meeting. I was probably the day of that slam session. They call the team meeting and <clears throat> cause it was, I remember it was like a Friday. So I think it was the same exact day and it was my first exposure to the team. And so I said, you know, what uniform, what time, what place and like, what's our mission. And he's like, Oh, you know, it's just going to show up at this time and be in your PT gear. And I was even like, does my name have to be on my PT gear? Cause you yeah. know, I seriously dude, I didn't have any of my, I just got thrown some stuff. From the Moffat team and drove out to New Mexico. And he's like, no, 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 Scott, you know, you don't have to do that. Just chill out. I'm like, okay. And then the the staff sergeant was like, were you a PJ before? I was like, yeah, you know, I was a PJ back in the nineties, but I just downplayed it, dude. He's like, all right, cool. Sure. And so I get there, you know, 15 minutes before the team meeting and there's no one there. And I'm like, where's everyone? And so he's like, well, it's in this room and it's in the main like meeting area in the dorm. I'm like, okay. So I go down there so now it's like five minutes before the meeting's supposed to start. And I'm like, who is everyone, man? I'm starting to kind of get mad because I'm like, dude, this is a waste of my time. You know, I could be at home yeah, getting yeah. my apartment ready because I'm going to pick up my girlfriend soon. I want to have everything dialed. And so now it's like five minutes after the meeting and the two staff sergeants roll in. They're like, hey, Scott, you know what's going on, dude? And I was like, hey, what's up? You know, where were you guys? Oh, you know, 
the meetings at this time, like, yeah, dude, it's like five minutes after, oh yeah, you know, whatever, no big deal. And one guy's got like a, a t-shirt on, it's like got, you know, a, a rock logo on it. And then the other guys got like, I'm like, I thought you said we were supposed to be in uniform. Oh yeah, you know, whatever, dude, whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, and then it's like maybe 15 minutes later and guys start coming down from the dorm that are on the team, on my team. And so everyone starts talking and then he's like, okay. And they have the meeting. They start talking about the first day of training and all this stuff. And then they're like, yeah, you know, we have, we're really fortunate. We have this guy, Sundance Scardino who used to be a PJ and he's on our team and the dude, it got quiet. And like, do you have anything to say? And I stood up and I was like, who the fuck do you guys think you are? And they're like, <gasps> like, do you guys think you're fucking PJs already? And they're like, Ugh. like they're all quiet. I'm like, dude, when you call a team meeting, you, you show up early, man. Have you, have you ever, I've, I've done this job before. And I told him I've been a TAC P I've, I've done this job as a PJ. I've been a firefighter. I, I stopped being a firefighter to come back here and train again because this is really important. And I said, when you show up for a meeting, you show up early because you don't know what the fuck's going on. Your helicopter could right. show up early and you're going to fucking miss it. You don't show up at the time. And I said, what's up with your guys' all fucked up uniforms? And they're all looking at each other. I'm like, I looked at the staff sergeant. Didn't you say that the uniform was PT gear? He's like, uh huh. I'm like, well, there's only I'm the only guy who's in uniform, <laughs> and they're all like, Ugh. I'm like, you got to be in the right uniform because if one of your guys goes down, and you need to go grab like his trauma kit out of his uniform because he's got it in his pocket where it's supposed to be, where we're all having our trauma pack, you can save that guy's life. But if everybody's in a different uniform, how the fuck are you going to help that guy? Right. And I just went down the line, dude. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, this isn't even day one of training. You guys fucking suck. And I just walked out of the room, dude. And I <laughs> the don't old even know crusty that, guy showing him what's, what's dude, what. I don't even know where that came from. Cause like, I wasn't thinking that the whole time, but when they asked me to talk, I just went off. I just left. And I, I got like a couple texts from the two staff. I like, dude, we're sorry, bro. Like, We'll do better next time. And I just was like, you guys suck. That's what they needed, though. That's exactly what those guys needed. A guy like you who'd been there and done that to police them up, man. Because just think if you would have been like, if you'd just been quiet and let them kind of operate that way, they they would have struggled through that whole course, man. You probably set them up on the, you know, on the right foot. It, shit went down like that through the whole training. And it was funny because at one point when we got, you know, through most of the training, Amber came out to visit. And a couple of the PJ trainee guys were like, what is wrong with Sundance? Is he mean to you? He's so mean to us. <laughs> <laughs> He's always mean. He's always yelling at us. But the thing was, dude, is I couldn't, I couldn't afford for them to make these small mistakes because every time you make a mistake, you know, you have to yeah. pay the man. Yeah. You're doing, you're doing push-ups. You're doing, you know, you're getting slammed. Right. And I was like, I'm, I'm almost 40 years old. I can't do six months of physical training because you guys keep fucking up. Right, right. And that, so that was my that was my MO. I mean, at one point we were out in the field and we're doing land nav and they gave us a packing list. And at one point, the sergeants were tired of guys not having equipment. And they say so they called us all in the middle of camp and they're like, we're doing an equipment shakedown. Dude, there was four of us that had all of our equipment. And the rest just decided for whatever reason, like, I don't need to bring this. I don't need to bring that. And we got slammed for five hours. And well, you know I don't even know what goes through a guy's mind. Like, it, that's the easiest thing in the world, just to, like, check, you know, okay, here's the first piece of kit. Put it in the bag. You know, here's the next one. Put it in the I mean, it's like, what goes through their heads? Like, eh. It's not a suggestion. I mean, <laughs> it's a packing list. I don't know, man. I don't know. And <laughs> And that, that was the time where I really laid the hammer down and I was evil because I was like, dude, you guys had a list. Are you kidding me? You cannot pack right. what's on a list. So yeah. And that's when I was like, dude, you guys cannot fuck up like this because I won't make it through this training if you guys keep fucking up. Yeah. And they, they made me the team leader at one point. And then the instructors came back a couple weeks later, like, dude, you can't be the team leader anymore because these guys, they're not doing anything wrong. And we want to be able to slam them and teach them stuff. But oh, man. when you're in charge, they don't fuck up. So sorry, we're not demoting you because you've done anything wrong. But 
we're gonna we're gonna make sure that you know someone else new is in charge, so that way when they make some mistakes, we can train them. So oh, it was geez. a really that's, really that's positive bogus, experience man. for me. <laughs> I loved it. It was a really positive experience for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then I got back, uh, and <clears throat> I think that I graduated in December, and our team was getting ready for a deployment. And, uh, so they'd been training for a year, at least maybe a year and a half. And the whole time, you know, I was asking the people in charge back at Moffitt, Hey, am I going to get deployed? Am I going to get deployed? Like, nah, dude, you're not going to get deployed. Scar, you know, you're new back in the career field. We have a whole team of guys. They've been training together for a year, year and a half. Like there's no way you're going. But when I got back from, uh, graduation, then we were going to places to train with the guys who were going to get deployed. Yeah. And it was at that time, I don't know, just because of funding, we didn't get the equipment that the people that were going to be deployed would get. So we was just kind of have to, there was a locker full of equipment that was kind of leftovers. And before the, the, the training, we'd have to go into that locker and try to find the stuff and beg, borrow and steal to try to get the equipment we'd need to go out and do these trainings, which was fine. It was, it was great equipment, but it just, it wasn't the stuff the deployment people were getting. Oh, okay. And at a certain point, I got a phone call. I remember it was, uh, it was actually, um, it was Valentine's day and I was at home making dinner for my wife and one of her girlfriends who were coming over and my team leader called me and said, Hey man, uh, so-and-so got in trouble and he lost his, his clearance for now. And you're the next guy with the most experience. So, uh, you're going to Afghanistan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I, I... And, I've heard yeah. I've heard this kind of story so many times from myself and other guys. It's just you never can believe it. The thing was though is like I definitely had a pit in my stomach like this is real, but I also was excited because I've been train I've been training sure. for this my whole life. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, cool, man. Now I actually get to go and see uh, what I'm made of. Because you kind of missed and out on so all that stuff. I mean, you 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 and I trained. You know, in the jungles of Panama and like, you know, the desert and wherever in the Arkansas. And then you got out and then you didn't get, you know, and you didn't get to be deployed as a tech P. Then you were a PJ and then you got out before 9-11. So it's like I can understand how, man, you're you're probably ready to ready to do something. Yeah. I wanted, yeah. I just wanted to see what it was all about. And yeah. so, I, you know, March 23rd, I was on a plane with the guy's gear. That had gotten in trouble because his his operating initials were KH. And so I had all of KH's gear in my bags going to Afghanistan. <laughs> Cause we were the same height. Oh, okay. And the same build. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, at that time you flew to Baltimore, and then from Baltimore you flew to Turkey. And then from Turkey you flew to, I want to say it was like Uzbekistan. Mm. And that's when shit got real. Yeah. And then what was wild, uh, I think I started to tell you a little bit on the, on the information was, uh, we got sent into country with a bunch of Georgian soldiers. Right. Cause our team is small. Like our team was like maybe 20 people. Okay. And they had a whole C-17 full of soldiers, but they were all Georgians. And so, you know, when you look at them, they had different, they had different, um, uniforms and different weapons and, you know, obviously speaking a different language yeah. and we got there and we actually got delayed because, uh, someone, some, some element was shooting at the transport planes when they were coming into camp bastion or leaving. So they were like, we can't fly you in until we figure out what this is. And we're going to fly you in at night to cut down on any chance of anything going wrong. And so I remember we were just sitting on this plane for hours with these guys and just hearing them talk and watching their mannerisms. Uh, cause I like to watch, I like to, I like to see that kind of stuff. I don't know, I'm always seeing what people's mannerisms are and stuff. And so it was just weird to see what they do. And then, uh, yeah. we got into country and a bunch of shit went down. But at one point in the deployment, their fob got attacked. Uh, their forward operating base got car bombed. And so it was wild to go back there and pick up those guys that yeah. we'd seen on. the Yeah. Yeah. We picked up about, about eight or nine other guys with all kinds of different shrapnel wounds and different stuff going on and stuff. It was, it was a wild time. It was, yeah. uh, it wasn't what I expected. Uh, it was, it was just much more 
going on. And, and I, I think I was there and it, it wasn't, uh, it was during the fighting season, which is wild what they do over there. Have you ever heard about that? But like yeah. the Taliban actually puts on the internet, we're coming from Pakistan and fighting seasons open. So Crazy. on the, on the, yeah, on the, you know, UAVs that are flying all around, you, they show you on a map, here they come, you know, yeah. they're coming from, they're coming from Pakistan and they're coming in and basically what it means is they're going to come in and they're going to extort money from the local people that are growing poppies, you know, heroin, but they're growing poppies. That's like one of the main um, it, it crops. Uh, I was in the Hemlin Valley, which uh, Hemlin Valley, I think, is like where it all goes down from what I know. The intelligence I was yeah. fed. And uh, we were on Bastion, which was, I think, technically like a, an English um, base. It was run by England. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and it was wild. Cause like right next to us, we were Pedro. That was our car call sign. That was our, our area it was called Pedro and, uh, tricky was the call sign for the, uh, 47. That was kind of like us, but not really. It was, yeah. it was better than us in that they actually had doctors on board this 47, but they only had a security detail. They didn't have people who could triage. And so, however, the, the patients came on the helicopter is how they were treated. So someone who might be an alpha who needs life-saving um, treatment might get loaded last because they didn't know how to triage. Uh. So it, was, it wasn't a perfect system. And so we would work with them a lot. And I know the deployment before us, because we did a six-month deployment, and then the people before us did a six-month deployment. And... Um, they had kind of gotten it worked out with Tricky that they would call us together. But for some reason, when we showed up, we had to get those relationships all back or whatever. And so yeah, yeah. we had to work with the new crew. And so, you know, there were, there were missions they were sent on that they weren't um, able to triage. And then they figured out, oh, we have PJs here. And so we worked with them and it was, it was a, it was a unique deployment. We got rocketed one time where it was a wild scene where again, through their intelligence, they saw that this guy, his, his code name was Raccoon because he only came out at night and he was some <laughs> local warlord guy and he bought missiles and they saw the missiles come in and they went to his camp and they were just dumb, you know, Russian missiles. Uh, they weren't guided in any way. Yeah. Um, they knew that we were being probed because they would, someone would send guys on motorcycles to different parts of the base. And then they drive out in the desert in a straight line, like, Oh, you know, there's someone trying to get a measurement of yes. how the distance is from a certain location. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, what would happen is, uh, when there was a storm, a wind storm or uh, something were higher winds than what the dirigibles, I don't know if you ever saw those with like yep. these rad dirigibles. Yeah. That can like do everything. They can tell, when someone's shooting from a different direction, because they have those, the equipment on there uh, and they have all kinds of cameras and shit, they had to lower the dirigibles because of the storm. And that's when this jackass, you know, shot his rockets at our base. Yeah. And uh, it didn't, luckily didn't kill anyone, blew up some things here and there, but it, you know, it was just another reminder. That, oh, for sure. You, yeah. You're running to the bomb shelter and you're like, dude, yeah, we're in combat, dude. So yeah. Never, you know, never had to do anything or I had to shoot anyone or anything, which is awesome. Um, just picked up a lot of people that had gotten messed up and got to use ketamine a lot, which was cool. Uh, <laughs> cause now ketamine's being used for people for treatment for post-traumatic stress. So it's, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. We used it for people when they got messed up cause they, we were told that if you can take them out of that trauma response, uh, as fast as possible, it can help them with their recovery. So you would tell them, Hey, you know, go to a happy place. Like if you like going to the beach, like go to a beach right now. And they're like, what? But yeah, dude, go to a happy place. And then we'd give them ketamine and they'd be like, Oh, thank you. And trying to hug you and stuff. Cause it would <laughs> take everything away. So yeah. I think that's so cool that you guys were able to, I mean, it, it, it happens that way a lot. The military is always like on the forefront of all this new technology and new, new techniques, but it's, it's kind of cool how you got to see it firsthand and then also transition out to the, you know, into the civilian world or, you know, I think that's really cool because you got, you were there kind of at the, at the beginning of it. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah, it was cool. And then, uh, my military career ended in August, I think it's August 18th, uh, in 2015, 
I was at my unit um, at Moffett Field, which is in Mountain View, California, in the Silicon Valley. And uh, it was like a 56-year-old man was on this ship called the Green Ridge. I sent you that picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's this huge ship uh, that transports vehicles. I think it sits about 200 or 400 feet off the water line. So it's like a skyscraper moving through the water. And yeah. uh, it's, it's crazy. Board. It's a huge ship. I'll post a picture on social media if you, for those who want to take a look at it, but it's a giant it's ship. It's shocking to see this ship and then our little Zodiac next to it. But uh, Well, when you said that, because it, it wasn't on the picture, but you said, yeah, we're the, or maybe it was on the picture, but you said we're the little dot in the Zodiac next to the ship. And I was like, that's when I, the, it, the full, you know, gravity of the, the size of the ship kind of hit me, you know, I'm like, what? This is amazing. It's crazy. Wild. So it's 10 o'clock, right? Basically it's like 10 o'clock on a Wednesday, I think, or something like that. And everyone's doing their normal stuff. I think we just got done with PT and everyone's back in uniform and we have different trainings we're going to do. And what would happen is the coast guard would basically call our operations center and say, we had a mission drop. And so I was getting ready to go someplace, but I got to put a text out on our cell phones. Everyone gets to the mission room. We got a mission drop. And so we come to the mission room, uh, which that was another thing I got to see. Like you just said, I got to see the unit back in the nineties and then the unit now in 2000 when it's guardian angel. And we had our, before we had a building that we had made into our unit. Now the, the state of California had built us a guardian angel, guardian angel building. So nice. it was, it's insane. It has a gym. It has a special place for the riggers to do all the parachute stuff and a huge tower to hang and dry the parachutes, have a team of life support people that take care of all of our radios and MBGs and, a person who just takes care of like uh, all of our helmets. I mean, it's, it's just, it's insane. And it's all in one building. There's an armory. We have our own armory. Uh, so we have a guy who's assigned to us all our weapons. We have our own mechanic, small engine mechanic who takes care of all of our vehicles. And it's, nice. it's an amazing machine. Anybody <laughs> yeah, who's yeah. worried about the military getting soft in any way is, does not have to worry. It's an amazing machine. It's amazing. Yeah. I got to be a part of it. it was, so this mission drops, we meet in the mission room and we see that, you know, a picture of the green Ridge that the guy had grabbed off the internet. Uh, Cause that's another thing right now you could go on the internet and put in green Ridge and you can see where this ship is oh, okay. in the world. It's pretty wild. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a 56 year old man and he's coughing up blood. Uh, we think for three days and he's in and out of consciousness and that's what, that's what we get. So right away we, we get a, a mission breakdown and I see that I'm going to be on the jump team and that I'm going to be the medic and that it's a thousand miles out in the ocean oh. is where this ship is. And the ship is going to turn around and maybe start heading back towards uh, America because it was, it was part of this training uh, mission where it picked up some equipment at Camp Pendleton and now it was on its way to Hawaii and then it was going to go to Korea. And oh, okay. It was like to test how long it would take us to get equipment from Pendleton to Korea if there was a conflict. That's what we were told. Gotcha. Um, and so this was one of the engineers on board this ship who was having a medical issue. And so now the Coast Guard can respond to things that are about 150 miles off of the coast, but they don't have any kind of capability to refuel their, their aircraft, at least not at that time. I don't think they still do. Uh, and so because... Uh, the California National Guard has helicopters that have that stinger on the front of it. The Blackhawks with the stinger it can refuel in the air. You know, the, the crews can fly a long time. So that's why we're right. called a lot, these kind of missions. So we get our med, we have all our gear already ready to go. Like everything is set up on these shelves for different types of missions. And so we just start grabbing our gear off the shelves and checking it you know, checking, checking the transponders to make sure that if something really goes wrong, we can be found checking our radios. I'm going through the medical gear, checking everything, even though I know it's all perfect. Cause it was, we check it all the time. It's got to do it again, just to say we did it. Sure. Sure. And uh, we got some, um, packed red blood cells from a local hospital and, uh, we jumped on an aircraft and we started flying, you know, the five hour flight. 
a uh, thousand miles out in the ocean. Man. Yeah. So you're on a, you're on a helo going out there. So no, we're flying, we fly out on a, it's kind of confusing. We fly out on a C-130 cause it's faster. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then usually what happens is then they also start getting the helicopters ready. Um, cause we'll fly out and jump in and get the patient, um, uh, ready to go to what, however, we're going to take them somewhere. This, this mission, what they were going to do was they were going to send an aircraft carrier from, uh, San Diego out and then send a destroyer out. The destroyer can move faster than the aircraft carrier, but the aircraft carrier has, uh, you know, a hospital on it. You're right. Okay. And so we were going to fly out. Uh, we got out on station and it was, it was wild. It was like 40 knot winds with, uh, the ocean, uh, 10 to 15 foot swells. Uh, mm. It was like a storm coming. Oh my God. And so, uh, I'm I, you know, on the way out, you know, I'm, I'm texting and calling my wife or my, she's my girlfriend at the time saying, Hey, you know, it's hard not to get a little emotional now, but I'm just like, Hey babe, I'm going out on this mission, man. And, uh, uh, hope everything goes cool. And I'll see you soon. And I, I, I think she was in a yoga class. And so I kept, she teaches yoga. So I kept, uh, texting her and calling her until I think the, the privacy, you know, the do not disturb. I think I broke it. And so finally she picked up the phone. <laughs> and, hey man. <laughs> And now to do a mission, you know, so, uh, yeah, we flew out there and then we, you know, we get on station and we check in with the, the, um, the, uh, the ship captain, Hey, you know, here we are flying around the ship. What's the status of the guy. And we got, you know, that he's still in and out of consciousness and he's got, you know, vitals that were decent. So we're like, all right, you know, uh, the team leader does his, uh, what his ORM, right? Operational risk management. And it's like, Hey, yep. it's, this is a good mission. Let's go. And so we got our Rams package. We, we load up all of our equipment in these, uh, waterproof bags. Um, I don't know how you did it, but it, it for our team, we always chest mounted our equipment, which is different than throwing it between your legs. Yeah. It, we, yeah, we never, we just did between the legs. Yeah. But so our team, for whatever reason was all about the chest mount. Uh, what we were told was that if something goes wrong, uh, you can do your safety operations and you won't get into some sort of weird body position where if you have that ruck between your legs and you go to bring your hands down to do your emergency procedures, you could get into some sort of weird spin. We had guys. For sure. Yeah. Really in yeah. So, so they didn't have any trouble getting to your handles or anything or your, your cutaway pillow or anything or. Yeah. It's all, they had it dialed, dude. That yeah. Yeah. So cool. I'm sure they did. I've got a shit ton of equipment on, man. And like <laughs> side story real yeah. quick. Um, I had, uh, I'd been in a motorcycle accident when I came back from Afghanistan, I was out riding my motorcycle. Uh, I was told that it's kind of normal for guys to have incidents like this. Cause when you come back from combat, your, your risk assessment meter is all screwed up. And yeah. so it was perfectly normal for me to jump on my Ducati and cruise around the Santa Cruz mountains really fast. Like it's, I felt calm when I was doing that. Uh, but I ended up crashing and broke my collarbone. And so my collarbone oh. had this plate on it, uh, with eight screws, this titanium plate. And when I went to put all the gear on, I'd never, I had jumped and stuff, but I never jumped with that much gear. And dude, it, the, the weight on that plate was like bringing tears to my eyes. It hurt so bad. Oh no. And I was like, all right, dude, you know, we're going to do this uh, mission. And I was like, fuck, I'd stand up and I'd sit down. I'd stand up and I'd sit down. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'll just wait until we're supposed to jump. And then I can stand up and I can grit it until I just get out of the plane. <laughs> and uh, we got out Man. and threw out the package like we're supposed to. And the way it works is like you throw out the package, you see the two parachutes are good. And now you're going to go out and it's a static line square. Um, our concern was because the winds were so high. Uh, this, the, uh, the package has an FXC that's on it. And this FXC is this device that when the package hits the water and there's that split second delay, it can detach the parachutes will detach from the package. And now the package will float in the water and it won't get dragged across the water at whatever the wind speeds are, oh, Okay. but it's only rated. It's only rated to like, I want to say like 28 knots or something like that. And it oh. was 40 knot winds. And so we were concerned, Hey, we're going to come out. We're going to go to half breaks right away and watch the package. And when it hits the water and it detaches, we're cool. If it doesn't, 
everyone's set up because what you do is now people have to take turns dive bombing that package and try to land on top of it so you can cut the parachutes off oh so, okay yeah jeez so, <laughs> god almighty stuff. yeah and then we're like okay so the winds are so high that when you hit the water just as you're hitting the water detach the the rings um so that you can uh cut away your parachute and it won't deploy your um reserve right i forget what those rings are but those yeah i know what you're talking about like, though yeah there's like once once you pull your cutaway handle it's supposed to deploy the other one but if you detach something right it'll cut it, it'll it won't cut it won't deploy that reserve automatically yeah have you ever had a cutaway when i never have jumping? not never 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 not once so I had, I had a one. couple of close calls where I had like a bag lock or I had like a, you know, some twists or something, but I've, I've always just kind of like wrote it out. You know, I've never, never cut away. Go what about through, you? You ever had one? Yes. Yeah. So I was going through training. Okay. No. Uh, I was re retrained. Right. And we're out at uh, Roswell because there's this cool drop zone out there at Roswell and it's a night jump, full moon, beautiful, full equipment jump. Uh, and I jump out and I'm having a great jump. And I go to pull and I get a bag lock. Oh, no, no. I got a line over. I got a line over. So everything okay. comes out and I'm looking up and I'm, I'm slowing down, but there's a really like a lot of noise. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the canopy like shaking. And so right, yeah. I, uh, I, I think the next safety procedure you're supposed to do is pull on the brakes and try to, you know, deploy the, deploy the brakes. And then maybe that'll open up the parachute, but I guess it yeah, yeah. caused the line over to get worse. Oh, no. I started going this gnarly spin, dude, like gnarly, so hard that like I could see space in between my shoulder harness and my body because I was turning so hard and it was stretching the harness oh. and I just, I didn't let it go more than a couple seconds and I did the cutaway. Yeah, yeah. It was so fast. I was so impressed with how fast the reserve parachute came out. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was like cut away, boom, I had another parachute right on top of me. And then I just it was it was a little faster, so it was a little little sketchier when I came down to land because I just remembered like it was I think it's a little bit smaller of a canopy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was my cutaway story. So back to the you know, thousand miles out in the ocean. We get out there, we get all our stuff going, the package hits the water, the package deploys, the the parachutes come off. I turn on final to go downwind or sorry, upwind. So I can slow down a little bit. Yeah. I, uh, I do the cutaway like I'm supposed to just as my fins, I can feel my fins and hear the water on my fins and the package, uh, between my legs came up and hit me in the chin and knocked me out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Did you have like a like an LPU or something or some sort of life preserver or anything? I think because I had so much equipment on and we jump in in dry suits. Yeah. That I, I I believe I just stayed straight up and down. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but like the waves or the water woke me up. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, yeah, dude. And I remember I just like checked my body over real quick. Like, hey, I'm I'm not bleeding anywhere. I'm good. I kind of felt this like little sting in my back, but you know, whatever. Right. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. always something when you're jumping or doing shit. And so I just went through everything. I, I detached my equipment and had like a leader line on it. So that's far enough away from me that I can swim. And so I started swimming my way back to the package and there, you know, there's these huge swells. I could see my guys and then I'd go down the bottom of the swell and I'd keep swimming. And it felt like I swim for maybe, you know, 45 minutes or so. And 45 back, minutes. Dude, it was Good forever, Lord. dude. I and you're not like, it, and you know, for guys like me who don't really go out in the ocean, let alone, or don't really, you know, I don't live by the ocean, but you weren't just off the beach. I mean, you're like a thousand, a thousand miles, miles out. You're in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it's like, this is, oh my God. It's wild. Cause I've, I've had two missions like this. Uh, I, my first one was like in the, in the 1996 or seven. And it was, it was nothing like this mission. And it was mellow, but still, I remember, you know, you fly in the plane out from San Francisco and you're kind of flying in the shipping lane. So you can look down and see big ships. And so you're like, all right, cool. If something goes wrong. One of these big ships is going to go by and see us. But then at a certain point you turn right. off of that and you start going in a different direction. And then you're like, oh dude, I'm part of the food chain now, man. If something goes wrong, we're going to be out here for <laughs> no a long doubt. time. Yeah. And you do oh, jump. Oh my goodness. You jump like a little butt boat. So you jump this little boat 
that you have, a, you know, it just sits back up by your butt that if something goes wrong, you can deploy that and get inside of it. But it's just oh, okay. I mean, nothing like a one man raft or something. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I wake up, I get, I get, I'm good. I'm not bleeding anywhere. I, I, I take my leader line. I get my thing. I start swimming. I get back to the package and the package had floated back into the parachute. So it's all wrapped up with all these lines and shit. And so we're trying to clear it all. We get it all dialed. We get it open. We get the raft inflated. We get all our equipment in it. And then we're trying to get this thing started. And it's, it's kind of a, a weak spot in the operation all the time is that if the, the fuel can be new and if you don't change out the hose that goes from the fuel to the engine, if any of that fuel in there has been sitting too long and it starts separating, it puts all those particles into the carburetor and the engine won't start. And uh. so it happens all the fucking time. And we got it started right away. And we're all like, yeah, yeah. we're fucking rock stars. <laughs> and then the junk got stuck in there. And then for the next 45 minutes, we're all taking turns trying to get this thing started as these oh huge waves goodness. are coming by. And one of my partners, uh, Jacob, he had the, the, they had paddles in there and he's trying to keep us facing into the waves as they're coming towards us, these huge waves. We get everything started. Finally, we motor over to the ship. And like I say, that picture, dude, you get next to that ship and you're like, Holy fucking shit, dude! Yeah, that, like you said, it's like a yeah. it's like a skyscraper. It's like a building that you're next to. Wait, so when you were in the water uh, doing all this stuff, like you were knocked out, you swimming over, you could, you could see the boat. It was like in the near vicinity to you. Okay, all right. I was like, was I was just thinking, man. Yeah. What, what would happen if what you guys were if you lost sight of it? Or I mean, do you have I mean navigation yeah. equipment that you could get to it or? Probably, but it stays right there because they want us to come help. Oh, sure, that. sure, <laughs> yeah. So they stay right there, and, and the, but the sea state was so bad that they weren't going to deploy one of their longboats, which is always always like kind of like what? So the sea state's so bad that you won't deploy one of your boats, but you're cool with us going through all this shit to yeah. deploy one of our own boats to get over next to you, right? But that's just how it goes, right? Like yeah. in, my, in my job in pararescue, they don't call you when shit's cool; they call you when shit's all fucked up. So right. We got over there next to the ship. What we, we radioed to the ship and asked them to turn into the wind. So they turned the ship sideways into the wind and to cut power, at least cut power long enough for us to get onto the ship. And so yeah. now we get over next to the ship and the way it works is they drop a painter's line. So they drop a, a rope along the length of the ship. I, I don't know how many feet, but a long part of the ship. And then we motor up next to it. We grab the painter's line. And then we keep our engine going and we keep our raft like at an angle and we get up next to, there's a cutout about 150 to 250 feet up on the ship. There's a cutout and they drop a rope ladder and then we can climb up the rope ladder. And then they sent a hoist over and grabbed our gear off of the raft and hoist up all of our gear onto the ship. And then we're going to get next to the um, ladder, the rope ladder, and then climb up. And our engine died. Oh no. And our engine died some weird vortex of water, something happened and the whole raft tacoed and kind of held us in place and suck and started getting sucked under the ship. Oh my God. We bounced up next to the ship and the whole thing starts to taco and we start to kind of go under the ship. So you're in the boat when it taco. Oh, geez. How many, how many guys are in there? Four. There's four of us. There's there's three PJs and a combat rescue officer. Oh and God. so it it didn't seem like a long time, but something happened and it buoyancy worked or you know, one of those Boyle's law or something kicked into place and we boom, we pop back up next to the side of the ship and the raft's open and I'm right next to the motor with the team leader. I'm pulling on the handle trying to get this thing started as fast as possible. We get it started. We go out, we do a victory lap. We kind of reassess what we're doing. And then... Thank God you're uh, alive. You right? Know. And it's like, well, we got we to get off the ship. Let's go back. So we go back to do it again. We get everything in place like we're supposed to. We're motored up next to the ladder. And the engine dies again. And this time when it died, we got sucked along the whole side of the ship. And it seemed like it happened so fast. And there was the reaction. I don't know what else we could have done, but there's that part that sticks out from the ship where the cars can drive up onto the ship 
Yeah. And the, the way the waves are going, I guess it went down, the wave went down and we went down under that. And we started to go behind the back of the ship and we're all of us are staring at the screw of the ship turning. And Jeez. I start scrambling. So I'm like pulling on the bottom of the ship. I don't know what I'm doing, dude, but I'm pushing or something. I mean, the, the guy said that somehow I, I pushed us out from underneath the ship. Oh my God. And I got pictures of it because the pilots thought these guys are going to perish. So let's take pictures of, of them <laughs> doing the rescue. And I didn't send you that picture. Cause I was like, this guy doesn't want to see all these fun pictures, but I got a picture of us when we came out from behind the boat. No, I'll the take ship. that one for sure. I'd love to see yeah. that one. It's crazy, dude. And, oh. and uh, we learned later that you can ask them to cut power, but it takes 15 minutes for the screw to stop turning. So I don't know if you ever wait 15 minutes, but I don't know if that's just something we learned. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got out behind it again. We got it started, you know, again. And then, we were like, what the fuck, dude? We we're all just kind of looking at each other like, well, we got to get on this ship, dude. That's yeah. what we're here to do. And I remember at one point, one of these huge waves goes by. Once we get out from like behind the ship, now we're exposed to the big waves. And this big wave goes by and we're trying to motor up the wave on our little Zodiac. We can't get to the top of it. So then we turn and come down and like surf the wave down. And then we get out around Jeez. the wave. And it's wild. Like, and it's, it's an adrenaline rush. So... It's like, um, when I think about it now, I can kind of get like sweaty and my body like reacts to it, like with this fear. But at the time it's like, you're living life to the fullest, man. Yeah. I wouldn't And plus, Well, not only that, but like it's survival mode at that point, you don't have time to freak out and, you know, be like, oh my goodness, this sucks. It's like, no, I got to do something now or it will suck. We're going to be dead. Oh my God. And plus- what else are you guys going to do? You're, you're in a little Zodiac in the middle of the ocean. I mean, it's like you can be like, ah, we're just going to blow off this rescue. It's like, where are you going to go oh, now? You got to yeah. get on the, this is your way out anyway. Oh my God. Yeah. And so we finally get over next to this ship, dude. And, uh, we get, get everything works. Finally, we get to the rope ladder <laughs> and one of my buddies goes up and he's like, all right, Scardino, it's your turn. And you know, from my firefighter training, dude, I'm like skipping rungs. I'm running up this ladder. And I remember the guy on the ship was like, now that's how you climb a fucking ladder. <laughs> like, I'm just like, doo, 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 doo. like a monkey, dude. Like I was up that sucker like that, you know, but then you're like, okay, I need to have all my gear with me ready. Cause what happens if one of the guys falls in the water or something? So you're still in this mode. We find, once we finally got on the ship, then you kind of was like, all right, whew, okay, cool. All right, we're good. Dude. Then I get in to see my patient and Wait, hold on. So what do you do with the boat when it's on the side of the boat? What do you do with your Zodiac? They they grabbed a gun. Like they have a, a pistol in the in the ship's inventory, like in a safe. And they came and, and they shot holes in the raft and it just sunk it. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. you just write that off. It's so like, you're not getting that back. Yeah, they didn't have a way to bring the raft up onto the ship. And so I think they just wrote it off. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then, you know, we get all of our equipment and we're like, all right, cool. We're here to treat this guy. And I walked in and saw my patient for the first time. And I knew from all my paramedic calls, his skins were all gray. Like the, just the look of them. I was like, oh, fuck, dude. Like, we're not going to be able to save this guy. Oh, no. Yeah. And so I was on a sat phone and my partner, Jacob, and I, we worked on this guy for 10 hours. Like we took shifts, but we worked on him for 10 hours. We we used every single drug. We used our everything. And we ran out of oxygen. We jumped in oxygen bottles too. And, um, they had oxygen on the ship. And once we used all of our oxygen, um, his O2, cause we bring in like a, we bring in a mobile hospital, bro. It's pretty impressive. Like we jumped in like defibrillator monitoring equipment that can monitor, uh, blood pressure, O2 sat, uh, blood gases. Once you intubate the person, uh, we had a ventilation machine, like we had all kinds of stuff, man. We had, like I told you, I had packed red blood cells and a machine that can heat the blood so it can go into the person at the right temperature. And we started oh doing all that. Like we jumped on this guy. We got IVs started. We got blood going into him. We're giving him uh, epinephrine to see if maybe we can jumpstart his heart so that he'll start breathing on his own and and maybe his O2 sat will go up. And he, we we're trying everything, dude. But Man. After 10 hours of using everything, we basically ran out of medical equipment and he went to a code. He, he went to full arrest and uh, we did a, we did all those procedures too. But at a certain point, 
we're getting a hold of the doctor on the aircraft carrier and we're like, hey, we got this guy and he's in full arrest and we've done everything we can for him. So we want to basically what you say is you're, you're going to call him, but you need a doctor's permission to do that. And there's certain yeah. parameters you're supposed to check to make sure that, you know, hey, maybe his blood sugar is low. And if we give him blood sugar, maybe that'll help. And he'll come, you know. Yeah. And it, it, you, the last thing you want to do is call it prematurely. I mean, you're like, you're, they're, they're there to save the guy anyway. So, yeah, of course. Man, I'm sorry to hear that 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 guy didn't make it. Yeah, Did you ever yeah. find out what the deal was? Like, what what was the, what happened to him? Nobody knows. What we, were, what we were told was that he had a similar episode where he was coughing up blood and he was in port, and so he went to the doctor right away and got treated. And this was his first trip back, uh, where he was cleared to be on a ship. And I, you know, he probably he looked like the classic. I don't know, but he looked like the classic person who's drank his whole life. And he, there's this thing called like varices, which I'm not up in my medical terminology, but basically the arteries uh, and the veins around his heart, they get weakened. And I think the aorta is the place where it's the most prevalent because there's so much pressure there and the walls get weakened by the alcohol uh, and they'll burst. Ah, okay. And so he had maybe a rupture somewhere else or somewhere close and he got that fixed, but then back on the ship under the same conditions. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, so, and, and we, the guy just might've not been healthy in the first place. I mean, you know, who knows? Well, there's no, yeah, because of HIPAA laws now, like you used to be able to get this kind of information so you could learn from it. But now, man, because of uh protection of people's rights and stuff, you never learn. Even when you take people to the hospital now as a paramedic, you used to get like, Hey, what happened? So you could learn from it and maybe have a better treatment schedule next time but you never learn now so wow it's crazy yeah it's it's crazy yeah so then it turned into okay extraction how are we going to get off this ship and so that's where it's super valuable to have a combat rescue officer that knows all the ins and outs and he got the helicopter from the aircraft carrier to come it had to fly and then refuel on a destroyer it, so it landed on the back of the destroyer refuels and then it came and it got on station with us and it sent down the, it's a, it's a Seahawk. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a black Hawk, but it's an outfit. I think it's a little smaller, but it's, it's outfitted yeah, for yeah. the ocean. So it's Seahawk. And so it sent down its hoist. We got on the helicopter and we flew to the destroyer. Uh, we landed, it refueled. They gave us some hot chow, which was awesome. And then, uh, no doubt. We flew, right. Oh, hot you guys had to be hot. exhausted, man. I just, you just, I mean, oh, oh, I can't dude. imagine like oh, going yeah. like, just a five hour flight, then jumping in, getting knocked unconscious, then swimming to the, the package, putting that together. Then the whole, you know, the whole fiasco of, you know, almost dying a couple times and then 10 hours of, you know, treatment, dude. Oh my gosh, man. Nobody it, gets it, dude. And there's guys I, right now doing this mission, bro. Like they get missions all the time at Moffett Field and nobody ever hears about it. Dang. It's amazing. And so um, we got on, so then we get on the helicopter, they land, and then we go to the aircraft carrier. And that was rad, dude. Flying <laughs> up on an aircraft carrier, you're like, holy shit, this is a floating city. Yeah. And we got there, we landed, and then guys came out and grabbed our stuff and walked us in. And they're like, the Admiral wants to meet you, man, right away. Because it's like, he's never met anyone or a team of guys that are trained to go out a thousand, mile, thousand miles out in the ocean to save someone. And he's like, he wants to shake your hand. So we got led all through this ship, which was incredible, man. It's so clean, so pristine. Each bulkhead is shined to perfection. This ship was immaculate, man. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. And then you get to where the Admiral's quarters are and everything's like, you know, cherry wood and just beautiful. And he's got a whole, you know, I, I think I'm a captain, I think is who's in charge of like at his beck and call. So we roll in and the captain's like at attention. He's like, all right, you know, Admiral wants to meet you and went in and he shook, a, shook our hands and talked to us for a while. And then uh, we went to where the helicopters live because since they came and got us, like that's, we're supposed to hang out. And then I guess at one point the jet pilots came down to say hello to us and yeah. the helicopter pilots were all impressed. Cause like, Oh, the jet pilots don't talk to us. Cause we're, not considered as cool right. as they are. Right, right. Pilots, like, you want to meet PJs because you were the guys who could potentially come save us if something goes wrong. And then at a certain point, it was decided, okay, cool, we're going to get another aircraft, which is called like a COD. But it's basically one of those aircrafts you see 
that the Navy has that they'll put like a dish on so they can detect submarines. It's a small double prop, you know, single prop, like double prop plane engine on each in, on each wing. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so now we're going to get catapulted off of the aircraft carrier, bro. Oh my God. Dude, it was insane. So <laughs> They don't, and, but no one tells you, right? So they get all your equipment. We stick it in the middle of the plane, which is cool. Like you, you fly and sit on the back of the plane, but they put all the equipment or cargo in the middle just because structurally, I guess it's, it works out better. So yeah, like and you're facing, balance yeah, or whatever. Right. And you're facing out the back of the plane. So we're facing out the back of the plane. Uh, we get on you, one of the engines going, but the wings are up and then he puts down the wings and then. There's a, there's a uh, flight crew guy who's putting you in like a five point harness and he's like grabbing any equipment that's not like attached to you. He's like, Hey, I'm going to put this in the middle of the plane. And you're like, okay, you know, that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> and we're looking at each other and going, dude, what's up with these harnesses, man. And so then you feel the plane get into position and the other engine come on. And then you feel like the k -k -k, and you hear the noises of like the cable getting attached to the plane. And then the flight engineer jumps in his seat real fast puts his harness on and he puts his head down and like shrugs his shoulders. And I look at my partner, I'm like, what's he? And I didn't even get it out of my mouth. The catapult hit the plane and our arms and legs go flying. And this thing goes from like zero to 160 <laughs> something miles an hour in like three or four seconds, dude, to like launch us off this aircraft carrier. It was insane, dude. Yeah. yeah, that was nice that uh, the flight engineer to tell you to, you know, scrunch up. Like, what the hell? And what a blue falcon. Like, come on, buddy. Share the info. He was like, I want to see He thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. He's like, watch cool, this. Man. Yeah. Oh, it's well, awesome. Anyways, you know, a few days later, I developed some severe pain in my back. And I found out, you know, later that I'd, I'd ruptured my L4, L5 when I hit the water. Oh man. Or maybe, you know, just cause I jumped all the time. I don't know. You know, there's a shelf life right on our backs. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And so I, I, uh, eventually got to see a doctor and he was like, dude, your, your days of being a PJ and being a firefighter are over. Cause your back, you've ruptured one of the discs in your back. And if you keep with this lifestyle, uh, you could have bone on bone and then, you know, you can't, L4, L5 is where the stuff goes through for you to like urinate and control your, your genitals. He's like, dude, you fuck up that area. And you know, so anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get it. Yeah. You don't want to, that's that was yeah, end of my take career. care of it. <laughs> yeah. That was the end of my career. Damn. I mean, yeah. and you probably weren't ready. I mean, I know it, you're no, getting older, but you're ready. probably like, you're still ready to do some more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you're never ready. I know. But yeah. So then I went through the whole, that whole transformation and, I don't know how much you want to get into that, but I mean, yeah, I, that was, no, I want to hear, I want to hear a lot of that stuff because I know you did, um, there was some stuff you did when you got out, um, you were uh, dealing with, didn't you deal with a little PTS or yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I came home one day from the pararescue section and I was on, you know, medical leave, but I would still go to work every day, uh, and just hang out and do administrative duties in between medical visits and stuff. And, you know, trying to get my back worked on. I didn't know I was done, done, but I just knew that my back was messed up and I needed to get my, cause what happened was my right foot dropped is what it's called. So because of the disc material coming out of your, your, your disc, you know, the, the fluid or the material, yeah. I don't know what it is exactly. It, it puts pressure on your nerve and it put pressure on the nerve that controls my right leg. And so I couldn't control my right leg anymore. I knew I was in bad shape. I got out of bed like three days after I came back from that mission and I fell down because my right foot wasn't working. Oh my God. And I, I didn't know what that meant. I was just like, oh shit, this sucks. And then, yeah, that's why I found out that we have to have to get an operation sooner or later to get that disc material removed because that will hopefully allow the nerve to work so that your right foot will start working again. Oh man. And so I got that done eventually, but I started drinking too much. Uh, cause I just dealing with the realization of, you know, I'm not gonna be a firefighter or a PJ anymore. I, I guess that was my coping mechanism. And I came home after doing this for a couple of months and my, my girlfriend, Amber, who's now my wife was like, I'm walking on eggshells. Whenever you come home, you're angry all the time. You need to get some help. And so I did, I started going to the VA and, uh, asking for help. 
But because I was so proactive, they really didn't know what to do with me at first. They were like, are you suicidal? And I'm like, no, you know, not yet, you know, and, uh, but I want to get some help. And they're like, well, okay, you know, we'll see what we got to do. And it, it took a long time to get into the system and, um, you know, I'll fast forward through a lot of it, but, uh, there's some milestones where like, you know, I get to see the doctor and, uh, he's asking me what medicines I want to take. Uh, he's like, you need to take some, you know, some SSRIs, you need to take some antidepressants and you know, what medicines do you want to take? And I was like, well, doc, I don't want to take any medicines, man. Like I got into this right. state without any meds. I would love to get out of it without. And, you know, as a firefighter paramedic, I've seen, I've gone to the VA and seen these poor guys from what I would call gorked out by being on all these meds, man. Like, I don't want to be that person. Right. And he's like, no shit, Jared. He's like, you cannot be in my program unless you take my pills. So I don't know if I should be ashamed about it or not, but I, I said, okay, well send me the pills. So he would send me the pills, but I didn't take them. Yeah. I would ask I my flight. I was, I was friends with my flight doctor and I would ask him, you know, off the record, like, Hey, what do I have to tell this doctor? The, cause when I read the side effects of what the medicines do, I was like, that's all the stuff I'm suffering from. You could right. be angry, you, could, you know, all these different things. I'm like, that's already what I'm dealing with. Why would I want to take these medicines that are going to cause this to happen? And I had some prior experience. My mother is bipolar and I saw her struggle with drugs and alcohol, you know, uh, as her coping mechanisms for most of my life. Uh, and then, you know, later on, she finally started getting professional help and they gave her like lithium and can't remember what the other medicine is, but she had to go between those meds. And I just saw how she struggled. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with that. So they would right. send the medicines to my house and I would just kind of lock them away. And then when I'd have to go see the doctor for a checkup, I would lie to him and tell him these are the side effects that I'm feeling. He's like, okay, you know, let's adjust them this way or that way. Cause that's the other thing. It takes six to eight weeks for the meds to even get to their therapeutic level. Right. And I've read all this documentation about guys who have gotten on these meds and it's tweaked them and they've, you know, committed suicide. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't want anything to do with that. And then you read, it takes six to eight weeks for you to, you know, come off the meds or for the effects of the meds not to work on you. And I've heard about guys being in that state of mind and, and taking their lives and, you know, doing things that they regret. So I didn't yeah. want anything to do with that. Um, so yeah. And, uh, I started off with the VA uh, I would, you know, talk to a, a female who was, a, you know, half my age, who was trained as a doctor, you know, as a, a counselor or whatever. And it just, it, it was, it was good to have someone to talk to, but at times when I would actually open up to the trauma that I was feeling, uh, and start having, you know, crying and emotions, I would, I'm not fucking with you, dude. It'd get to a point like 45 minutes into the visit and she'd be like, okay, we're done. I got I got to schedule your next your next appointment. And I would go out to my car or sometimes I'd ride my motorcycle and I would just be numb. And I'd be out in the parking lot going, what is going on? I'd call my, my wife, Amber. I'd be like, dude, this lady just broke me apart. And now I got to a point in the call or in the visit where time's up and she just kicked me out of her office. Like what, what the fuck do I do now? Yeah, and that was my yeah. experience with, you know, the VA. Um, our team brought in some doctors that were trained in EMDR, uh, which basically, I can't remember exactly what it's called, like eye motor, like disassociation recalibration. I'm getting it wrong, but basically EMDR is this thing where, um, they'll either have you hold these balls that vibrate left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, some people have you tap on your chest. Um, some people have you tap on your knees. There's different ways to do it. But basically, from what I understand with post-traumatic stress, you know, quick version, when you're in that fight or flight and shit's going down and you and I have been trained to act rationally and make decisions and, and help people, that traumatic memory, uh, it's there's parts of your brain that store memories. Right. Right. You have your, your most basic part of your brain, which, you know, I, please don't quote me on this. Cause I'll, I'm a lay, I'll get some of the, the terms wrong, but from what I understand, basically you have your lizard brain, 
right? Which is like your medulla of Agata, right? Your lizard brain. You have your puppy brain, which is like your hypothalamus something, something, which I'm not saying it right. And then you right. have your, 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 like your, your human brain or like, you know, the, the front of your brain that gives you all your consciousness. Well, your puppy brain is where all of your memories get stored. And when you experience trauma, one episode of trauma, it can take like, you know, four to six months for your body to process it. And eventually that memory gets stored into your puppy brain. But the problem with guys like you and me or firefighters or police officers or, you know, people that experience a bunch of traumatic scenes, one right after the other, it all gets all jumbled up, man. And it doesn't have the time. Again, this is my layman's terms, right? right? It doesn't have the time to get processed and put into the puppy brain. And so you have triggers. Um, your smell is the, is the, um, uh, most prevalent trigger. Uh, right. I would smell gasoline and right away I would start to tense up and I'd hold my hands like I was holding the weapon. Really? One of my, yeah. Yeah. My wife would tell me about it. I, I'd start to get sweats and uh, get hyper. I'm very hyper vigilant. I think I still am hyper vigilant, but not as a trigger, but um that could be just yeah. from your training that, you know, you, you, yeah. we're just, well, we kind of have a tendency to be that way. Yeah. One of the things I did in Afghanistan, uh, one of the missions we went out on was a aircraft that crashed. It's a really cool plane and they outfit it with all this gear. So, and it flies around and it can pick up on stuff that's going on. And it had a massive failure. Like one of the wings broke off. And I read articles about it, that it had these condition where if it was on autopilot, it had maybe too much equipment on it, possibly, I don't know, but something happened and one of the wings came off and it went right into the ground. And then, uh, we went out there, uh, to pick up, to pick up the sensitive items and to, uh, put the bodies in body bags and bring them back. Um, you know, right. Once they're. Mm -hmm. We put flags on them and stuff. They're considered heroes now. They're call sign or heroes, but smelled right. a lot of gas. And so I think maybe that's why smelling gas sometimes can trigger these memories for me. Um, anyways. Yeah. So, no, I mean, it makes sense for yeah. sure. Yeah. And so uh, I was learning about all this stuff and learning about these triggers and learning that when you're repeated, all these repeated traumatic episodes, you know, I've been a paramedic firefighter for 24 years. So I've been on every kind of call not, not bragging in any way, but I mean, I've seen no. how people can die every which way possible when you've been a, a paramedic long enough and you've worked at busy fire departments like uh, LA County and San Jose fire. And so it's all jumbled up in here. And so there are ways EMDR can help you process a memory. So like one at a time, because of that back and forth, back and forth stimulation between right and left brain, uh, even the lady that I was working with would have me stare at corners of the, of the walls, like where it intersects with the ceiling, that can be a way to kind of get that left, right, left, right motion. And you go through the memory in different stages and it like rewires your neurons to where now you still have that memory and it can still be painful, but it won't trigger you. It won't cause you to have this trigger response where you go back to fight or flight. So it can still be a painful memory, but it won't have the triggers associated with it. That's what EMDR okay. does. Very, very. Gotcha. When you have a person who's, who knows what they're doing, it's very effective, but it's one okay. memory at a time. Not to, not to put it down, but it's one memory at a time. So yeah, yeah. when you've had a lot of stuff go on with you, it can, yeah, it's a lot of treatment. Yeah. So, you've had, like you just said, you've had decades of these traumatic experiences. So, uh, oh man. So did that work for you? Like, did you have to like think about every single time or what did you have to move to something else? Or like, I've worked you, what, through, you know, like, like triage, right. I've worked through the mission that I went on. Um, yeah. we worked on the guy for 10 hours. I've gone through the thing that happened in Afghanistan where we picked up the bodies. Cause that was pretty traumatic. Yeah. EMDR was effective and you work through painful memories. Maybe the ones that are, are your triggers, you know? Yeah. Are your triggers? I have this. I had this reoccurring nightmare that, like, I'm with my firefighting crew, and there's a gas leak, 
and I'm the only guy who puts on my equipment and my SCBA and all the stuff like you're supposed to. And the rest of my crew just walks out there nonchalant and there's a huge explosion and everyone perishes except for me because I have all my equipment on. And so I've worked through that one. Uh, And I have some childhood stuff too that I've worked through and it helps because I don't have the same responses. Um, Meditation helps huge. Like I meditate every day, um, just focusing on stillness and quietness. It's not magic. It's just, I just focus on being still and quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I told you, like I cold plunge every day, uh, oh, yeah. pictures that has been a game changer, dude. Cause I can wake up from a nightmare or wake up just feeling angry or something, just whatever. And, um, I get in that cold plunge and the minute I get in that, um, like it's my, I think it's sent to like 48 degrees. I get, I don't know, this, this stuff happens in my head where it just all goes away and I'm just sitting there quiet and at peace. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, a bunch of people talk about that cold plunge, like for both physically and mentally, mental, um, you know, benefits, but I've never tried it. I want to, I should try that. So the game changer for me has been, I saved up my money and I, I built one of those um, barrel saunas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now How's that? Not, it's awesome. Cause now I'm not so like, oh, if I'm going to be really cold for a while. It's like, well, yeah, I'll be cold for a little while, but then I can go jump in the sauna, dude. <laughs> That's, that's I, but I've heard that's the it. thing to do. I've heard like you, you do the cold plunge, then you get in the sauna. Some people do it back and forth like a couple of times. I mean, that, that I think I that shock to your system is just like kind of snaps you out of the, whatever mental thing you're doing, but also the physical thing where your body is like, whoa, I need to, I need to amp up my white blood cell count or something. Uh, there's some weird stuff going on. It kind of generates some sort of healing property in your body or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Acupuncture has been something that helps me. Uh, I, I hadn't slept for a long time and the, I went to that, see an acupuncturist. I wasn't sleeping because of nightmares and stuff. And she put all the needles in my ears and around my face. And then I went home and crashed hard. It was really? awesome. That shit is really? legit. Uh, and then having someone who's like, not necessarily a massage person, but like a, like mine is like trigger point release. Cause if you're having certain pains and stuff in your body, you can't sleep. And so when you can't sleep, then you start having shit go down. So that's helped me a lot. Uh, my wife's a yoga instructor. So, and she does a lot of different treatment modalities for body movement stuff that helps me, uh, the working out. I mean, I, I have to modify a lot of stuff cause of my injuries, but I work out every day with my wife and, um, yeah, you uh, still look like you're in the, sh- the same shape we were in when we were kids. <laughs> I, work I mean, hard, you look. <laughs> I work hard, but it helps yeah. my head, man. It helps my head. Yeah. We started doing this thing called Green Door, the Green Door Life, which is like a nutrition program. Uh, so I've really worked on my nutrition, which just means like knowing which foods to eat when and how much. Uh, right. You're actually supposed to eat more, you know. So and then, and the Green Door Life has like a bunch of people that are trained for strength training and different stuff. And then you get into once it's weird, once you get your diet right and you're working out a lot, it opens up your mind to want to do like the next thing. It's almost like it's this uh, checkoff list. And so I've been a lot more into mindfulness and stuff. I went and did, uh, I, I tried ayahuasca um, to help me. Uh, most recently, a friend of mine from high school uh, she got into this, her and her husband, her husband's a special forces guy who got blown up in Iraq and has had tremendous pain in his hips for years. And they went and did this thing called Bufo. So it's okay. basically Sonoran desert frog venom. So it's the pimples that are on the back of this desert frog. This thing like sits underground for like 10 months out of the year. And when it finally comes out, cause the rain wakes it up. It comes yeah. out, it feeds, it breathes, and then people grab it and get all the poison out of it and put it on these glass sheets. And then it dries out in the sun and then you flake it off with a razor. And now you have Bufo, you have its properties and it's all flaky and you smoke it. Huh. And it's changed my life. I've done, yeah. I've done four journeys and the minute the medicine hits you, it lasts between like 15 minutes and 45 minutes. So it's not like ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is like 12 hours. Yeah. Um, and right away, man, I time traveled back to Afghanistan to the scene of the crash. And 
I got to hold hands with the five guys that I helped pick up and they were basically like Sundance, thank you for doing us a solid and, and, and being respectful of our whole transition. And you don't have to carry this with you anymore. Wow. I've heard, yeah. I've heard a lot. Of, I've, I've been talking to a lot of guys about that, both guys that are advocates for it and guys have actually done it. And, um, and not, not necessarily those, I mean, ayahuasca I've heard of, but there's some other, there's other, like, um, what do you call them? Uh, psychedelics. I, if you, for lack of a better term, they're starting to have some validity. They're starting to have, they're starting to get gain some traction in Washington, you know, with those guys. And I think it's a, and I think people, I think they have a, a kind of a weird stink on them because they think they're drugs and they're like, you know, they, they equate it to like Coke or meth or whatever. And it's like, it's not, you're not doing it to get high. You're, it's like a medicine. It's almost it's like a medicinal kind of a purpose that, you know, in order to kind of reprogram your brain and like, you know, set everything back up the way it's supposed to be. I don't know. Is that kind of yeah, your experience? What you, you, yeah. 100%. You, you know, you, it's not a, it's not to get high. You have an intention and then you have attention to healing and you never get to control what the medicine heals or how it heals. Cause it's, I, it has its own plan for you, man. And it heals yeah. you. And I've been, I've had very positive healing experiences with, um, with mushrooms, with, uh, this Bufo with ayahuasca. Um, I've tried, um, MDMA. Uh, I've also have a friend who is a life coach who we did a bunch of healing with LSD. Uh, and it's all about just having the right like we went into it with, we're going to help you with your anger. We're going to help you with your nightmares. And then it was just the setting. You make sure the setting is like, it was like this healing setting that yeah. my buddy has set up at his house and you have music playing that doesn't have any words because the words can make your brain attached to stuff. Wow. And the minute you're taking these medicines, there's like a similar thing that happens where I call it, and I've heard people call it sacred geometry you start to have this like kaleidoscope of colors and shapes. And I believe that means that you're all the filters that we put on ourselves in this civilization or this society, the medicine melts those away. And so now you get all the information at once and that can be scary. And that's why you need people to guide you. You need like sure. guides to help you when you're using these medicines. But um, I agree with exactly what you said, Jared. It's, it's a way to, reprogram rewire um help heal uh this experience as human beings because we all are going to experience trauma in our lives in one form or another and so you and i just for whatever reason have ran towards a lot of things to help people yeah and it's it, kind of going back to what you were thinking about about the va it's like there's these certain medicines that are approved by you know the uh, whoever uh, but they're the one, they're actually a more of a detriment. And I mean, you take, talk about like the, um, you know, the uh, opioid epidemic and just all kinds of d d prescription pills. And it kind of equates back to, or harkens back to like, who's, where's the money coming from? I mean, I, I don't want to get too far down this road, but I mean, it, it, with this other stuff, it's, it's, um, there's nobody's regulating it. Nobody is making money off of it. So nobody wants to, it's, they have to condemn it. They have to like demonize it in some way but yeah, I've heard I mean, a lot of guys that yeah, helps, man. Yeah. I mean, I, the opioids and the different pain mills and the psychotropics, man, they have an amazing function if they're used correctly. But like you said, I think, you know, big pharma doctors, whoever the healthcare system, it's just not set up in a way right now where it can really regulate and treat people, you know, through all your injuries, through all my injuries, man, they give you a huge thing full of Oxycontin or different types of painkillers. They give you 10 or 15, 20 more pills than you're ever going to take. Right. And I don't know, you know, I, I don't want to get conspiracy or sinister, but it, it doesn't feel like this medicine is, is pushed on us or given to us to cause anything more than addiction. Yeah. It, well, it of course, because... They want you to keep buying the, they want you to keep buying it. And yeah, we get it for free through the military or we did when we were in, but you know, somebody's paying for that, you know? So if they're like, oh, we need to keep, keep giving this to the guys, keep, you know, make it, 
normalize it. This is what you should do. This is the how you treat that particular ailment. It's like, well, not really. I mean, there's a, a myriad of things you could do to treat this ailment. You're just doing this because it's a money maker or it's easy or whatever. Who knows what the real reason is? But yeah, you're right. There, yeah. It, my point is, the the care of the of the patient doesn't seem to be at the forefront of the reason why we're giving all this medication, which is kind of no. crazy. <laughs> it should be the other way around. Oh. Yeah. And so to switch gears, like, so in another, at a point in my healing, at some point, my physical therapist that I was working with at the team was like, have you ever thought about playing golf? And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, I, want to get into well, this. you yeah. know, uh, I uh. played golf when I was a firefighter, but I have a back injury. Like I can't play golf. And she's like, no, Sundance, that's not what I'm telling you. Like, you're going to, I want you to go out and walk. I don't want you to ride in a cart. I want you to walk. Because walking is one of the best things you can do for what you got going on right now. You're going to be in these cool settings because golf courses are gorgeous. No one's going to know who you are. They're not going to know your story. So you can just go out there and just unplug. And she's like, don't swing hard or anything. And as long as it doesn't cause any new pain, like this is so beneficial for you. And I went out and played golf. I came home and my wife was like, what did you do today? And I was like, uh, uh, went and played golf, you know? And she's like, dude. <laughs> Your smile, I have not seen you smile like this in like six months. So whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it. And so then one thing led to another and I ended up uh, starting to forming with some other businessmen, um, a nonprofit that we call OGA Vets. And we take uh, four Navy SEALs, four Army Special Forces, four Air Force Special Operations and four MARSOC. Uh, on these golf retreats. And uh, when you're out on the golf course, you know, you just relaxed and the businessmen can mentor the, the veterans because uh, they're successful businessmen. So if these guys are trying to start their own businesses, they'll mentor them. We brought in a sports performance doctor. Uh, his name is um, um, K um, Casey Edwards. And he comes in and he's a sports doctor. So he helps the guys with injuries and like how golf and different stuff. And then we've, I've helped a lot of veterans get their benefits um, because I'm a disabled veteran and I was very successful because I was a, I was on it, man. I would, I was calling, I, I, I get no's, but no's didn't feel right. It didn't resonate. It didn't feel righteous. So I just kept asking questions until I got the right answers. And so I'm a huge advocate for veterans getting their benefits. Uh, a lot of guys feel like, well, I don't need a handout. And I always tell them, um, uh, you know, Roman soldiers back in the day, they would serve. If they survived and they got to their retirement, they were given land. And then on that land, they could grow vegetables, whatever it was they were going to livestock. And they could take that livestock to market and they earned it. And that was their retirement. And that's what this is going to the VA. You need to go to the VA and get your benefits. And yeah. if it's not for you, for your kids, because if you get the right disability rating, your kids can go to school for free. Right. Uh, I was super fortunate when I went into the VA to start my first checkup, a Marine sat next to me, this old Marine sat next to me and he put his hand on my leg and he's like, have you been saved by Jesus Christ? And I was like, oh man, you know, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. And he goes, well, don't worry about it. I'm going to pray for you. And he goes, you're going in to get your first physical. And I'm like, yep. And he's like, all right, son, this is not the time to be tough. And I was like, what? He's like, everything hurts. When you go in there, everything hurts. Let them do the tests. Let them determine what's the level that you're hurt. But this is not the time to be a soldier. Because right. if they tell you to touch your toes, you'll touch your toes because you're a soldier. Right. That's what you're taught to do. But if you start to touch your toes and it hurts, stop where it hurts. And I just was yeah. like, wow. Okay. My, yeah, it's so, yeah, exactly. It's so mind blowing. Because we, because, and I, I kind of had the same deal. I, I struggled with getting, a lot of the stuff up front because I would be like, well, yeah, it hurts, but it, it's always hurt. Or, or, yeah, I've, yeah, I've dealt with pain this for the last couple of decades, so who cares, you know? But it, that's, but you're not supposed to hurt like we do. You're not, you know, most, some people have pain and whatever, but yeah. you're not supposed to have these pains all the time. This chronic, you yeah. know, almost debilitating sometimes pain. So that's perfect advice for sure. Yeah. So that I've, I've, I have my benefits, and um, I also got this thing called combat ready, right? CRSC combat related special compensation pay because I got hurt on that rescue mission and it was as dangerous as being in combat. So that's another pay uh, that I get. And through having these benefits now, 
I'm going to school. So the VA has this program called um, Vocational Readiness and Employment. And I got online, I did the research and found out that if you want to do a job that requires a degree, they'll pay for you to go to school. Because I have the post 9-11 GI Bill. You have to have, I think it's like 30% disability and one day of your post 9-11 GI Bill left uh, and you they'll pay for you to go to school. So I just finished my first year at um, Community College of San Mateo or College of San Mateo. Uh, yeah. I thought that I wanted to do maybe business administration because it would help me run a nonprofit. Uh, but man, the business accounting classes were a drag. Right. Oh, my first class, my first math class was statistics, which oh. have you messed around with that, Jared? Not much, no, but I, I yeah. enough to know I don't like it. <laughs> that it's not, I, I don't, it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Everyone has always told me that statistics was their hardest class. And yeah, yeah so I switched my major um, next semester. I'm going to start in the fall. I'm going to start with kinesiology because I want to be a sports doctor. Uh, I want to focus on uh, helping veterans, uh, helping firefighters, helping police officers, using plant medicine, using all the treatment modalities that I have used that have helped me, that help me every day. Uh, but if you're a doctor and you have the right initials after your name, um, you know, more people listen to you, policies get changed, you can you can make uh, a change. So that's that's my new mission. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. And plus it's your passion. So it's, it's easy to, to do something like that when you're very passionate about it. So it, it's not even yeah. like work at that point. Yeah. No. Well, that's awesome, man. This, that's my story. this has been great. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I can't, I, I, this has been fascinating. I, I knew, you know, and I knew it was going to be this way just from, cause from knowing you from before uh, we had such a blast. I knew, and just following you on, on social media and just seeing, you know, kind of, I see little updates here and there, but yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you were, you came on and, and got, I got all the details and all these stories. Cause there's, it's so awesome. You've, you've had such a, a diverse career. And the thing I always liked about you, um, one of the things, the, the main thing I liked about you, there's tons of stuff, but you were always like, we were, you know, when we first started out, we were like combat oriented and like, we're kill, kill, kill. But you, you, you never were kind of that way. You were always like the, the, uh, super caring, nice guy, um, compassionate. Uh, and I, when you went to be a PJ and then a firefighter, I'm like, that's perfect. I said that, that was, that defined those two jobs, you know, being, being a paramedic, you know, rescuing people, helping people out that that's always been your MO. And, uh, I, I really, uh, I, I think that's commendable, man. I really thought, I really think that's awesome about you, the, about the way you are and kind of the, the, the path you've chosen in your life. So yeah, good on you, that. man. Yeah. I appreciate that. For sure. it, there, it was such a cool time. Cause I, I believe like men are like swords and you got to sharpen them. Yeah. And the way you sharpen them is you, you bang that steel together, man. And you and I definitely had our moments where we were having a great time oh, yeah. training and just growing up as men. And really that time that I got to spend with you, is what helped me uh throughout the rest of my life and, same here and i can't say enough about you know keith ingram keith ingram yep. and the guys that we had that helped us when we were young men I'm, i would always encourage young men and women to join the military to join the fire department i to become police officers i would i would always encourage people to i will always encourage people to do that i just think what we need to work on um, as a society or as, um, career fields is how to teach people how to process the traumas that they're going to see and experience in a healthy way, as opposed to, you know, party and drinking compartmentalizing because it, it right. works for a while, but at a certain point, uh, I believe I've been told we have these like emotional backpacks mm -hmm. and once they get full, they pull you right off your feet. And yep. I believe um, but there's new stuff that's happening too, which I love. Like now we're not calling it uh, post-traumatic stress, we're calling it post-traumatic growth. Okay. Well, because... I know we dropped uh, a lot of guys dropped the D off completely. It used to be PTSD. Yep. That's gone. It's not a disorder. It, you know, it's, it's just stress you're receiving. And then now you're so, now it's growth and which is even better. Yeah. yeah because you that, go that through, stigma off it. You got to go through trauma to grow. Sure. I mean, think about working out, man. When you're working out, 
you're traumatizing those muscles, breaking them, if you will, so they can heal to be stronger. Right. And that's, that's, that's right. you know, that's, that's, I think who we are as human beings is we, we, we experience these traumas and then we choose to grow from them. And so that's how right. I am looking at post-traumatic stress now is it's post-traumatic growth. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of those things that have happened in my past that were quote unquote trauma because Same. they've made me a stronger human. They made me a better person. Well, I, to your point, it almost seems like people are working so hard to avoid any kind of stress or any kind of trauma nowadays that they they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be offended. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to have any, go, any kind of adversity. They they want everything super easy. And I'm like, dude, that's not because if you if you go through your whole life doing things the easy way when you have to do something hard it's going to be exponentially harder to do that thing but you know but if you are, are experiencing right. hard things you know throughout the all along the way as you it, experience those those adversities or the the trauma it's a little bit easier to deal with you know i think and that's my theory anyway but yeah i'm with you, right? I, 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 I'm with you man I, I don't think you should shy away from any kind of adversity i think you should try to seek it out and you know get used to it at least or some way at a very basic level, that's why I jump in the cold plunge every morning because it's, it's facing an adversity. It's like that shock, like, okay, I can deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So. All right, brother. This yeah, has been is. awesome, man. I, I, I can't I thank you enough for doing this. This is, this is oh, great. Man. Thank I you. appreciate it, man. It's good catching up. And uh, uh, yeah, stay in touch. Stay in touch. I, I appreciate your time, definitely. Oh, yeah. My All pleasure, right. man. This is, uh, this is great. Yep. Thank you, man. All right, dude. See you later. See you later, brother.